This is the Wheel of Time Spoilers Podcast. Today we are joined by Ken, or Obi Thunder, however uh, you would like to refer to him. And I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself, because this is your first time on the Wheel of Time Spoilers Podcast. So, who are you? Where are you from? How did you find Watt Spoilers? And how did you find Wheel of Time, the, the book series? All right. I was handed the eye of the world by my buddy joel peterson in high school and we were reading we connected because we were both reading just crazy fantasy books and he's like oh if you like fantasy you should read this it's pretty good and i think it was like book seven had already come out by then so every year just like everybody else does oh the new book's out the hardcover comes out and then you read all the other books and that's when the paper book comes out, so you read that one. And... I did not realize how common that was until I started asking people. And everybody, that's pretty much what everybody did. There was so much detail. Yeah. That was what you had to do to keep up with the books. Yeah, and I, and for me personally, I was the only one who did that. So to hear other people do that, it was amazing. Yeah, yeah. I So I just kept doing that. And I actually, to be completely honest, um, once I did know that Robert Jordan was effectively going to pass away, I was like, this is ridiculous. I can't believe like who's going to finish the book. What's going to happen. I am like, I need this to finish. Cause I had committed like 12 years of my life to this and read it probably 15 times by that point. I will uh, agree that I had some not great thoughts when I heard that he had died. <sighs> um, yes. I was all angry, yeah. all angry thoughts. Yeah. I won't say all angry, but and... the angry thoughts were there. And I like that Fool for Life is calling it the bleakness. That I really do feel like there was a moment in real times fantasy uh, fandom community where we suffered from the bleakness, and that was after he died. Like, it seemed like there was no coming back from that. Yeah, and, like, I had heard, like, oh, Brandon Sanderson was going to do it, and I'm like, I don't know this guy. It was kind of like having your friend get a new, immediately get a new significant other, and you're like, I don't know them. I don't know who they are. Like, who are they? Who are these people? <laughs> so I gave it some time, and I honestly... I'm, all of my friends now know that this series is my favorite series, but it also scarred me in the fact that if a series is not done, I refuse to read it on the fact that I'm like, it hurt me one time and it hurt me so bad. So like, unless a series is completely done, I'm like, I'm not going to start it yet. Well, that certainly saved you from uh, George Martin's antics. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I read that. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, but that got started before this well, lesson was learned, so I would assume. Yeah, like, I mean, I started that forever ago, and then it's like, oh, he's writing these books. He's pumping them out pretty fast. He's got a book series. He says he's written, you know, six and seven. Like, that's cool. And then all of a sudden, it's never coming out, and I F you. Yeah. I don't care. I was going to say, in fairness, the uh, series might as well be done. He pretty much read all he's going to ever come yeah. out with. <laughs> yeah, I'm cool. Kind of a funny story about how I found your podcast. I. In where I live in Los Angeles, they start playing Christmas music at like before Thanksgiving. So I'm like, you know what? Forget this. All my friends like podcasts. So I'm, you know what? What's my favorite thing? Wheel of Time. Great. Let's do it. And I listened to, I found a couple other podcasts before yours, and they just, it seemed as if like for two and a half hours of the podcast, they would talk about the book for like 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then the other, you know, the four or five of them, or however many there were, would like just, talk about each things in each other's lives which fun but i don't care <laughs> <laughs> i'm not like if it was the opposite yeah like books for two hours their lives for half an hour let's do it crank it out i'm gonna do it and that's basically what we do here yeah i mean that's uh yeah. we've always and i've always uh put the personal stuff after the music yeah so you have that choice like we're done talking about the chapter if you want to hear the personal shit you are more than welcome to it yeah but I'm the same yeah. way where I don't, I don't want to be forced to listen to it in someone else's podcast. Yeah. And then I found your, well, actually, so I did see yours first. Then what did throw me off was the spoilers. Hmm. And I was like, hmm. And then I was like, you know what? Whatever. Let's try it out. Spoilers. I've read it all. So obviously I'm not spoiled. And then I want to say like 10 minutes into it, I was like, I need to listen to all of it. <laughs> so I just love the fact that it was like, you know, the first, first episode, you're just like, this happens. And I was like, oh, yes, I did. And 
just completely went, went through. What did I spoil in the first episode to make it very clear we weren't messing around? Was it Rand dying? <laughs> or I, I can't yeah. remember what it was that we were just it's, like... It was, it was exactly that. You were like, and this happens. And I was like, oh, they are not joking around. No. I am <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> this, I mean, and that's when people are like, the, the spoilers tag is on the front of it. Because, I mean, there was a certain amount of anger that went in to creating Watt spoilers. <laughs> when I attempted to have these conversations on forums and was shut down over various spoiler taggery, and, and we ended up spending the entire time arguing about whether something was a spoiler or not, rather than talking about the actual subject. And I was like, no, this is spoilers. The whole thing is come in with your blinders off. Yeah, <sighs> yeah. I feel like that yeah. was kind of my litmus test when I first tested the podcast out as well. Was like, okay, what are you going to tell me about the prologue then, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, an hour and a half later, I'm like, that was awesome. Next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And then I, so I, I binged and like, I hear it's, uh, it's so like nice to see people are like, Oh, I just started the binge of all the podcasts that I'm like, I love it. But they have like, you know, 200 plus episodes mm. to do. 300. And no. I only, Oh, Jesus yeah. three, this is 337 only... man is this three? Oh my god I can't even keep up with the numbers now. <laughs> but so like I, I think it was like number 80 where I was like I don't care or 80 maybe it was 100 was when you went to your first Jordan con right yes so it was like 80 or something where I'm like I don't care I gotta be a pa- I gotta be a patron this is amazing I like listened to like four episodes a day so obviously I'm in with guys <laughs> nice and so at that point, I'm like, here's, here's support you guys. It's fantastic. It's amazing. No, and you've been around for a long time, yeah. Yeah, and at 100, was I'm like, I'm not going to start doing anything on the Discord because I want to be caught up. Mm-hmm. And as it was number 100 that I was, where I listened to you guys, and I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm caught up. This is fantastic. And that was when I started being more active on the Discord with everything. So it was like, I found that to be really interesting that a lot of people don't want to jump into Discord until they are done with the binge. Yeah, I've noticed that too. It's a really funny trend. Yeah, like I, well, for me personally, it was, I basically, it's like, it's like catching up to a TV show where I want to talk about all of the TV shows, but if I'm on episode eight and all you guys are in episode 12, I mean, now being in the Discord, it doesn't matter. But until I join the Discord, I don't know that. Right, right. To be personally, I'm I think two or three episodes behind, and for me that's like that's awesome. I listen, I just crush them in one day, hmm. and then I was like, ah, oh, crap, that's right, I do this at home. <laughs> I gotta wait, and I'm like, ah, oh, great, super. But it's nice to have that like straight through. I was talking to a radio about we were looking at sort of the numbers on various days, and just you know, on days when we don't release an episode, we still get a large number of downloads and that's a lot of people who are binging who are either like doing the whole thing from the beginning or just doing little mini binges where they save up 10 20 even uh more than that episodes and we'll like do it all at once i feel that though about wanting to be caught up because it's aside from responding to the content like hey you said something 300 episodes ago and you were wrong and i want to talk about it like aside from that that, is hard yeah there's also (laughs) like people being at a different point in their lives, right? Like a lot of people right now are on the binge and they're back at episode 30 and they still think the podcast is being done with Seth and Patrick. And I just want to apologize yet again for not having Patrick's amazing velvety voice to grace your ears with because it's just... That was nice. That was nice. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I can't do that. But it's like, you know, you don't want to join in with someone's conversations when you are three years behind in the little bits of their life you do get caught up with at the end of the episodes, you know? Like pre-COVID stuff, going to parties, traveling. Mm-hmm. Like it's hard to, right. to leap from someone's world of that to like whatever we're doing now. So yeah, Megs, it's almost like time travel. <laughs> And we already have a bit of time traveling just in the time it takes to edit these. And I'm right now that's a fairly high jump. I'm going to push that down after we get through this book. So it should be more like a two-week lead time rather than a month. 
Uh, Because the goal is to keep publishing episodes and not record for a little bit after this episode's over. Uh, So pull that slack (laughs) in just a little bit. Yeah, (laughs) just pull that slack. It's not quite a full month lead time. The gap is nice, but I I like a little bit of a short. Yeah, six episodes is a bit much. It's a bit much, and it's like it drifts up to seven depending on our recording schedule. Yeah, I did find out though that I I cannot listen to you guys in the car, Um, specifically because like I scream and yell. I'm like. Because, like, sometimes you're like, oh, what is, uh, what, like, and you'll say, like, an honest question, like, oh, what is this? And I'm, like, screaming in the car the answer. And I'm like, oh, that's right. This was, like, forever ago. Damn it. <laughs> no, and I always love the feedback, but I especially love feedback on, like, episode 10 or, like, 20 or, like, even anything in the top 100. And I'm just like, guys, <laughs> I barely remember doing that. <laughs> Like, hold on, let me go listen to what I said first, because I don't know what I mm. said. And then I can come back with an answer, because, bro, that's three years ago. I don't even know. <laughs> like, I don't even know what I said ten exactly. weeks ago. Exactly. Like, three years. Oh, my God. Yeah. 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 Come at me with a quote that's semi-correct, and I'm not, it's not even that. Yeah. Well, yeah, the, the, I feel like the folks who are here live sort of fall into that category more so than... Yeah, we're getting a lot of people who are saying things that I personally empathize with, like, this is why I joined the Patreon, so that I could stop yelling at my phone, because yes, this is me, (laughs) I yell at my phone. (laughs) And those are the people who are here yelling at us in person right now, telling us why we're wrong. So, yeah. Yeah, and then you hear yourself in the recording, and you're like, oh yeah, I was there that time, I got to yell at them in real time, that was good. (laughs) Being mentioned is fantastic. Like, I remember I recorded... It was, uh, you had mentioned my Obi Thunder at some point, whenever, and I remember literally recording it on my iPad while my phone played it, and I sent it to my two Wheel of Time friends, and I'm like, look at what I did! (laughs) This was me! (laughs) Like, I was Obi Thunder! (laughs) That is something I do try and really make an effort to do, is when I steal something from the chat, um, credit the person I steal from. Uh, <laughs> just because literally yeah. makes my day yeah. uh, but I don't always you know it's sometimes in the flow of conversation I can't always it doesn't mean I don't really appreciate uh, the stuff that comes from the chat it's just hard to always give credit without breaking the flow of what we're talking about yeah and I remember like when I was just obsessively correcting you on every single thing and it would be like eight comments of me like you would start to just stop crediting me and just take the ideas like as they were presented because it's like okay for the fifth time Aradia has the answer <laughs> like, uh... so I was on you guys were on Malkier Talks mm-hmm. and I was typing and I got a, a, on a bit of a tangent and they kept saying oh and Seth says and I'm like you, no, stop crediting me. Just take it. Ah. <laughs> Just take it. Use it. Use it. Like now I didn't you know want how my... the other shoe fits. I know. <laughs> I'm like, no. I do. Can you, you credit me once at the beginning? But there's plenty of content there that I'm just tossing out that you can either use or not use. That's that's my goal here as an audience member. And it was so much fun to be on the other side of that. By the way, it's the first time I feel like I've ever been uh, in the audience. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. For that small, intimate Discord live kind of thing, which apparently Malkia Talks hadn't done that in a long time, and really enjoyed getting back into that space. That was fun. It was Because, like, with Dusty Wheel I've been at, but that's so big. Yeah. It's, all, it's a very different feeling. Yeah. That's, that's very separate. Yeah. I went from being excited that you mentioned my name once to being a co-host. It's been a wild ride, but it's been fun the whole way. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely nice to meet you at the at Spoiler Con, totally. uh, where I was like, oh, you're a radio. I've heard your name. Like, it's like, I've heard your name, like, what like who are you like i just heard your name on a podcast like it doesn't matter right and it's like but you're famous but you're my famous <laughs> well and one of the things i really love about this sort of format is it's very democratic in terms of the content that comes through the chat mm-hmm. right like all that matters is how well you know the content and then you and then we we're able to form these friendships and connections without like form like having these personal biases or preconceived notions about who each other are yeah, but it, it it's definitely been surreal, like, having my reputation precede me. Like, all I wanted to do was correct some random people on the internet who were wrong, and now I, I have a reputation that precedes me. I have people telling me it's weird to hear my voice in real time because they're so used to hearing it on recordings. Like, <laughs> what? You sound drunk. What's wrong with you? Oh, you're not at 2X. <laughs> That's right. 
<laughs> no, no, I don't actually speak at 2x, guys, as it turns out. Oh, yeah, no. I can only speak at 1x. Not a chipmunk. I never thought, so, like, true story, true story. In high school and college, I made fun of my buddy who had internet friends, and they were internet friends. He he met them over World of Warcraft, and I was like, that's, they're literally going to kill you. Like, they're going to show up at your house, and they're going to kill you, and that's just, no, when they're killing you, just remember in my head, I told you this. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> And then as I'm flying to Portland to meet all of you people, all I'm getting from in text messages are, hey, so it's really nice knowing you. You're going to die. Are you going for a weekend? Oh, you're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. Do you know these people's real names? Do Who is this person? What is their name? All the stuff that I gave him. And I'm like, look, man, I'm really sorry. Like, I just, I was in a, I was in a place of anger and I apologize. And I yes, I am going for five days to another state to meet people to whom I have never spoken a word to, but yet only talk to like me and Lumen back and forth on Facebook and Discord and Instagram. Oh, we kill it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I met that, and I really met that guy like one day. Like I wanted, I want to meet him again so bad and beat him. At <laughs> Good luck. But, yeah. That man is I a know, he's so, Oh, he's so smart. Yeah. Damn it. But I'm trying. So, <laughs> yeah. Do you know how hard it was for an extrovert like myself to like be in a giant room of introverts? I'd be like, I need to, I can't like, holy crap. Like I got to like put, sit on my hands. For this. <laughs> like I am raging Italian and a raging extrovert. And like, I'm like, I literally like at the second I talk to somebody, I'm like, oh, you're an introvert. Oh. <laughs> just, just handle with care. That's the <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, you are you are our uh, our pet extrovert that we keep around because you're awesome. Just let just let me <laughs> run around that. Just let me run around for a minute, and then I'll get all that out, and then I'll just sit down for a minute. Like, yeah, just gonna be just. Let, I just need high fives. I just need high fives from everybody in the pool. All right, are we ready to dig into fifty three? Oh boy, the, why not? It's been a yeah, half an hour. Yeah, yeah. Let's move from the delights of our community to the utter horror of what happens in this chapter. The Feast of Lights is pretty delightful. Okay, well, Sulin meets her toe. Perrin... Mardi yeah, Gras. Right? Perrin yells at Barolain. Rand has been three days kidnapped, one day in a box. We get to deal with the box. I think the the box. Box. Alina and Savannah, like, are all over being on stage. And also R.I.P. Desain. Mm-hmm. It's a bit of a heavy chapter. A little, a little heavy. A little heavy. Slightly... Yeah, but now we can start singing, I got our Rand in a box. Rand in a box. <laughs> but yeah, the Feast of Lights is it's in and of itself a hilarious setup um, for all the other things that are not hilarious. The Taken chapter, the first the first 20 minutes of Taken, the movie chapter. Now, Fire Phoenix, mentally, how long does it take to leave, how long does it take Rand to leave the box? I don't, uh, until Vans of Gold, Maybe. Or, or maybe 20, 30 years after the end of the last battle. I mean, um, oh, for sure, veins of gold. It's a long time. Did you ever really get over trauma? Mm, true. It's a, this, is, this is the chapter where you see the trauma in all of its, like, searing awfulness on him. Right after this, it's just him dealing with it. This is the chapter where you see it happening. Yes, Margaret. Phenomenal cosmic power. Everybody loves space. It's, that's a really good meme of that, actually, for Rand. With Chodan Collar. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, Ken, would you like to read us in? Oh. The people dancing in the streets of Kyren exasperated Perrin. Making a way through was near to impossible. A line dance snaked past him behind a big-nosed fellow with a flute and no shirt. Last in line pranced around a little woman who laughed merrily and took a hand from the waist of the man in front of her, trying to pull Perrin in behind. He shook his head, and either his yellow eyes frightened her, or his face looked as grim as he felt, because she swallowed her mirth and let the line lead her on, glancing back over her shoulder at him until the crowd hit her. A graying woman, still handsome, with slashes of color halfway to the waist of her dark silk dress, flung slender arms around Perrin's neck and stretched up her mouth hungrily towards his. She looked startled when he picked her up gently under the arms and set her down out of his way. A group of men and women his own age, capering to tambours, bumped into him, laughing gaily and plucked at his coat. They ignored his head shaking until finally he pushed one of the men away hard and snarled a lead wolf growl at the others. Laughter vanished in gaping astonishment for a moment, but they were roaring again and trying to imitate his growl before they frolicked away into the throng. Madness. Utter madness. All right, on on that note, if you haven't been to a Mardi Gras, go. I've never been, but like, 
after COVID, I feel that people deprived that it actually sounds good. So one thing about the Feast of Lights is normally this is the shortest day of the year, right? This is Christmas. Yeah. Normally there'd be snow on the ground in Kyrian, right? Kyrian's not that cold. Or not that warm, I mean. Uh, Kyrian's... Uh, it's pretty far north. It doesn't, it doesn't snow there. No? I, for sure. I thought it did. It doesn't snow in Ebu Dar, but I was pretty sure it did snow in Kyrian. I could be way off. It's at a reasonable uh, latitude to get snow. Yeah. I mean, it could snow. I just don't remember if it ever... They don't mention it snowing because the world is starting to get warm. Is on fire. <laughs> the, warm, the world is on fire, yeah. The, like, it's been on fire for a while. So this is, like, definitely... So what I'm thinking is a lot of this debauchery may be, like, even more outlandish than usual because, oh my god, it's actually warm for the first time and all these, like, shirtless people normally wouldn't be this, you know, crazy because it would be too cold. Well, I think they'd be crazy indoors is what would be happening. Mm, fair enough. I think all of this bacchanalian orgy nonsense would just be indoors instead of in the streets. Right, but the whole, like, which who's indoors? Are the, you know, are the ladies going, are, does everyone go into the palace to kiss? Like, what's... I do not know, but I bet it's kind of a little bit like winter night, where, like, everyone goes from house to house. Mm -hmm. But with more sex. I also... <laughs> Yeah, I feel like it's just, it's it's exactly like Mardi Gras, where it's kind of like a get in where you fit in kind of a place. Wherever, whenever, it doesn't matter. Gotcha, gotcha. So a lot, lot of big coats on the street. A lot of big coats. Yeah, we see the similar thing in um, Abu Dhar during the Feast of Birds, where it's like normally everything would have been inside because it would have been raining and cold, but it's all out in the streets because it's right. dry and hot. Yeah, and people have their shirts off. So why not? And they're throwing wine over themselves. This is literally like a party for Bacchus. It's nonsense. Totally, totally. I mean, he has to be taking from that that history and that Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, him growing up, where, or RJ growing up where he grew up, I mean, he had to have gone to a Mardi Gras at least once. Oh, right. Of course. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, Mardi Gras back in the 80s and 90s, oh, that's probably exactly what he's describing. <laughs> Because when I went, it was sip. It was like a toned down version of what you just read. So, but I love how Perrin was just walking around, just pissed off. Oh yeah, because Rand is. I mean, at this point, Rand has abandoned them, right? He's yeah, really pissed off. I like this lead wolf growl that he has. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, he has yeah, had it up to sure. here. <laughs> and as it's been six days since they since Rand quote unquote left or was kidnapped. And three days since the Aes Sedai left, right? That's an important timeline thing. So Rand's been captured for six days, but only actually confined, or they only actually being left, taken out of the city for the last three days. But yeah, Perrin has been on age for six days. <laughs> I think they get almost a four day lead because it takes them a while to get their stuff together to take off after them. I almost felt like it takes them too long to get everybody together to go. But I mean, they were marshalling what is the beginnings of Perrin's grand army to go so it does take them a minute to get all this stuff together to leave but you know he does have a lot of people to take i mean you're going after what 30 some odd eyes to die you need everyone that is willing to hold a pointy stick in that army he has no idea it's, how many he's going after he's, oh, i know he thinks it's 16 <laughs> it's like actually 30 yeah like he mentioned i think they mentioned six yeah six of them yeah they have grossly underestimated he's got to grab as many people and he's even telling them would you fight Aes Sedai? And everybody's like, for for Rand, yes, absolutely. Because they they kidnapped him. This is what we do. He they kidnapped our king. This is a a we have to. Though there's the whole thing with Ruark being like, I can take Siswayaman, which is like oof. Yeah, well, yeah, he's because he was like, I can't take a lot of people, but I can the people who he's like the people who I can send are maidens and Siswayaman mostly, I think, because. Maidens are just going to say, we're going. Right, because son of a maiden. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he has a choice there. <laughs> yeah. He's like, well, I guess I'll send the people that will, wouldn't stay anyway. Yeah. And the Siswayamon are the spears of the dragon. So they're just going to be like, well, if the maidens are going, we're going to have that. Right, because they are the and spears of the else. dragon. That's all they are. They have to go. Much like them. Exactly like you said, much like the maidens. They, it's, that's not an option. Yeah, they're just a step behind the maidens. and. 
he's like, well, uh, yeah, I guess I can send him. Are you, though? But yeah. But yeah, he's like not, he's worried that because Rand was taken by the eyes to die, the other Aiel won't be able to to follow. That would be too big of a stretch. Only the people who are either dealing with the bleakness through violence and dedication or are a maiden are going to be able to like deal with that cognitive dissonance. Uh, and the other issue that we have going on is the Shido are on the move. And as we actually oh, yeah. see later in Crown of Swords, that was the deal that was made between Galena and Savannah, was that the Shido were going to be a distraction to make sure the rest of the Aiel couldn't come after the Aes Sedai. Right, yeah. Dispersing yeah. the Aiel with Aiel is... It's a very effective strategy. The Aes Sedai were totally right to employ it. Without the Maidens being Rand's personal protectors, without the Siswayamon being Rand's personal protectors, all of the Aiel would have stayed. It wouldn't have been Dumai's Wells. It would have been just pairing with some people and, and some wolves. Oof. Trying hard. And failing. But, yeah, exactly. The Ashaman would have come in as well, probably. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, the, he, I think I think without without the Aiel, I think he might have had a harder time. Well, which who from the Black Tower did he end up taking with him? Was it Grady? Narishma. Yeah. Oh, Narishma. Oh, There's a thing where he points behind him and he's surprised he pointed at Narishma. I remember that. No, Dashiva. Thank you, Keith. I can't keep those two straight uh, okay. for some fucking reason. Yeah, you do always get those names switched. Uh, <sighs> thank you, Keith. I get those mixed up all of the time. Oh, really? And yeah, I know yeah. Narishma has the fun bells in his hair. And Dashiva is Osengar. Like, yeah. <laughs> I can't keep them apart. Every <laughs> single time I read the books, it's been like 20 times. I'm still like, ah, oh, you gratify me so much because that is my problem. <laughs> all of the time. And I'm like, oh, Dashiva, he's my boy with the, with the, the bells in his mm-hmm, ears. Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, oh, I'm suspicious of Narishma. Like he's actually a forsaken. And like, no, no, no. Yeah. Same, same. <sighs> Narishma is very pretty and Dashiva is uh. very plain looking. The bells make him very pretty. Oh, there should be no reason that I can... Yeah, no, it's, it should be easy. Separate. It should be easy, but it's not. It's just not. Exactly. We are the same person. Ken and I are the same person right now. Well, and they're also... They're <laughs> yeah, two Ashman just... introduced at the same point with rhyming names, and they both seem fairly minor the whole time. It's not like they have this big role that they're making a lot of changes to until there's a betrayal, right? And, one, right. and then Shiva goes bad. One's a forsaken, one fulfills the most meaningless prophecy ever. You know. Right. <laughs> and, and and one is the most meaningless forsaken ever as well. Ugh, so true. <laughs> he's already done his thing by creating the Trollocs. He doesn't He doesn't have a laboratory. What the fuck is he going to do? Right, yeah. He's a, a geneticist without CRISPR. Exactly. Yeah, he doesn't even have, like, a basic lab set to make elephant toothpaste. Like, what is he supposed to do? Is there elephant? To- is there elephant toothpaste? Well, that's just the name of that one experiment that makes weird foamy shit. I forget what goes into it, but yeah, it's it's a couple of simple chemicals and it creates like a big pillar of foam that like stacks really tall and then falls over. It's hilarious. It has nothing Pretty to do with elephants heat. at all. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was like, why did she bring up toothpaste for elephants? <laughs> Check it out on YouTube if you want to see some fun chemical reactions. Also, can I? I know we I know we glossed over the Mardi Gras part, but. Can we just say a good a good for you to Herod Fell right now? Yes. Yes. Oh my god. Yes. Just good for you, man. I'm so proud of you every time I read that article. In a lot of ways, though, I always feel like it's the the sex scene before the monster kills the couple in the horror movie. Oh, yeah. Oh. It's definitely that. Damn it. Because, like, in the, pro- in the epilogue, he gets his... Pieces torn us on yeah and this is the this is the last time we see a hair fell alive i forgot that we saw him one more time so well parents saw a lot of him that he didn't want to see yeah but... we saw a little bit of him over here a little bit over there when how many he gets torn limb for limb in the epilogue yeah i'm trying to look i just flipped ahead to it it doesn't say how many days after duma as well as that is <sighs> but yeah he he definitely doesn't make it long after this but yeah he's dancing with Three at once. Oh, the scandal! And what, what's what's the line? I know, um, Perrin. Come on, man. There's this great line like, uh, "Bell hardly seemed able to remember his his own name." Perhaps not surprising in the circumstances. <laughs> I mean, honestly, if I had three, you know, pretty people dancing attendance on me, I probably wouldn't remember my own name either. So, I, can I kind of headcanon Rand in his old age becoming Herod Fell? 
that like he gets caught up in his studies and research, loves being in the library, but also like goes out there and gets on gets it on with three women at once. Sounds like Rand to me. Oh my god. I'm yes. I mean, I'm not mad I, at it. I'm not mm, mad. Mm, mm, yep, head canon established. That like he remains in anonymity and just like retires into a library and does research and like of course you know who's there with him the whole time in the men. library. Loyal. Oh, also yep. men, but loyal. Men. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> you're right. Loyal makes more sense in what you were leading into. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I was like, <laughs> yes, but I was going for loyal. <laughs> You know, I, I I bet he wanders for a while, but I could definitely see him retiring into a library when he's too old to really wander anymore. Oh, for sure. Yeah, he just wants to be the guy to read some books and drop like that. He's going to be like that kooky old guy that somebody walks up to and goes, wow, that guy really knows a lot. And then nothing happens from it. And I wonder if he'd still have the like weirdly long life of a channeler, which would mean that he'd have to have Loyal as a companion. Would he? Well, I don't know. I think he would have to make that decision, to be perfectly honest with you. And he would just, like, have to decide when to die, kind of, like, lighting the pipe. Uh-huh. Be, like, disincorporating, like, in Stranger in the Strange Land. Yeah, like Yoda. Yeah, I was thinking Yoda, Yoda, Yoda life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just laying down when he gets tired and being like, it's time. Yeah, I'm done now. It's time. It's time for me to go visit my three wives who have passed away much long since. That makes a lot of sense. And catch badgers with Matt and Perrin. At least two of his women should also be fairly long. Two of his women. Two of his wives should be fairly long-lived. But, like, Min honestly deserves to have first crack at him in the afterlife because she put up with the most shit. <laughs> well, she was with him for the most of the... She was with him for most of the books. Yeah, she had to put she up with the most always. shit. <laughs> oh, yeah, true. Yeah, Darth... Most... All of Darth Rand she had to put up mm-hmm. with. I would say in sheer time, I think Avienda is there longer. Yeah, days spent together, yes. The time spent in the waste is an interesting nebulosity because they spend a lot of time together but not as anything other than like really annoying antagonists so yes but that is that is time together yeah so in many ways elaine actually gets the least by far yeah oh she first 100 percent. she gets like i think if you could go through the whole books together she might get eight or nine days it's very fairy tale <laughs> like oh my gosh like she, she meets him once at her mom's and or. Her mom's house. And Andor. Her mom's house. <laughs> her mom's house. The, the palace. Mom's house. Her mom's house. You know. <laughs> yeah. And then she like doesn't see him again until they're both, you know, ragingly, you know, the almost the queen and he's the dragon reborn. Well, there, there's the thing in tier so. with the making out and the letters. Right. There's those three days. That's three days. Or nine? Uh, well, it's three days of them kissing, yeah. as I recall, in yeah. narrative. They're, like, there to, together longer, but then there's, like, a three-day countdown before he has to leave. Right, exactly. They don't actually, like, make contact until there's only three days left. Yeah, then it's just all the contact. Then they're just, like, making out in corners. And by the way, don't make out, like, oh, look, look here's a corner. Okay. <laughs> it's so cute, but it's so ridiculous. Also, shout out to Idrian having a younger man. Oh, yeah, Idrian's getting it just as much as Fel. Yep. Idrian, oh, yeah. She's the head mistress. Yeah, kissing a man young enough to be her son. It's all about like the old smart people getting the like young, flighty young people and just being like, oh yes. <laughs> Listen, sex education has to come in some form or another, and knowledge has to be passed from the older generation to the younger. As a uh, sapiosexual, yes, people's brains are where it's at. So I can definitely see a bunch of you know freshmen going and being like oh the professors open season yeah i i can see that no freshmen or have ever been attracted to professors no never never, <laughs> never happened not ever not nope. ever nope <laughs> never never <laughs> yeah but yeah i just think that it and the maidens hating adrian being the whole like what? crazy like controlling the cannons and controlling all these inventors and like i always think back to this moment of this young guy on a lap mm-hmm. I, I bet that they're mostly students too from the school. I bet they're not random carry on. I bet a lot of them are students. A hundred percent they're students. One hundred percent. That's who you know. Yeah. Yep. Got a little of that um, suppressed. Because then you can make out and never talk about it again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and just be like, yep, that was that was great, and let's never do that again. Oh, great. We were both blackout drunk. We can totally never do that again. Never talk about it. It's fine. <laughs> Gotta bring that A up. Absolutely. Kyrie and it are so weird. Yes. 100%. And this is the one night, and you can see, 
like the maidens obviously hate it because they're you know kissing in public so ooh, none of that I uh, alarm yeah and then yeah woof. and then dobrain walks in and goes and she's like the complete opposite of like these freaking people he's like he's the biggest fun anchor ever <laughs> just why would you do this i have a job which is funny because he is kyrianan yeah he should i'm you know what i'm sure that he did this a few times you know what i don't even know because he's such a fun anchor right now that i don't know if he did this or not as a kid which he should i bet he did yeah, perhaps he, i feel like he has too much responsibility now to join in right, but he like, probably he's... did it because it was his responsibility to have that experience as a young man Right. But, like, now he doesn't have to, so he doesn't. <laughs> right. Maybe he didn't do it so well. Yeah, probably. Yeah, well, and I mean, like, he ends up getting together with, like, Caroline, right? No, no, no. Oh, yeah. Wait, we're no. th- I'm, that's uh, Darlin. You... Darlin. Other D. Other D. Yep. Other okay. D. <laughs> 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 Whoa. Calm it down, sister. What? Okay, the other, other white water meat. for a minute. <laughs> Dang. What's, what's up, lady? Oh, I do have, I do have a question for both of you. What? Why was Fayil mad at Perrin right now? Because, uh, okay, this is the whole thing. Is She just had this whole thing with her parents where she's like, this is a strong man who knows how to control a woman. And here she is being kind of a little crazy, and he's coddling her and using all of that forceful controlling energy that she wants directed at her at Bear Lane. Oh. And so she's disappointed in his, basically his interactions with Bear Lane and the way he's he's reacting to her coming on to him because he she essentially wants that forceful like you stop right there to be directed at her Mm -hmm. and instead he's like why are you wasting all of this effort you need to treat barreling like a child be like girl get out of here i'm busy yeah he's treating them the opposite of how she thinks they should be treated and so she's like clearly he likes her more than me because he's yelling at her and coddling me and, like, she knows intellectually that's not true, but, like, it's a completely the inverse of what she subconsciously expects. And she's being very immature about that discontinuity. Which I fully understand, because I've always been the big guy. I've always been larger than every one of my friends. And for me, it's, like, people have always handed me things and said, don't break this. Mm. Don't, don't do this, because I'm big. I'm bigger and I'm stronger than everybody. So everybody just assumes I can't be gentle. So I come back with that saying, I'm the, I have to be so gentle with everything. Yeah, whereas I'm, Especially, I'm the opposite. I'm, I'm not that, that big of a guy. And people, and I'm like, people are like, why are you so forceful with everything? And I'm like, I, I don't know. I'm just trying to put it down gently. It just breaks. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> There's times where I wouldn't touch something because I'm like, I might break that. I won't break it, but it's been ingrained in my soul. That is such a parent mood. Yeah, that's a very parent mood. Yeah, 100%. Like, my, I remember vividly, like, my... Nep- my not nephews, but my, my cousins, those are babies. I'm the oldest in my family by like 10 years. And my mom would be like, okay, do you want to hold your cousin? And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's a baby. It's, I don't care. And she would literally make me sit all the way back in a chair and hold the baby. And she's like, okay, there you go. Be careful. And there was somebody on my left and right mm. making sure. Great. Thanks. This seems super fun. <laughs> way to build up your confidence in your existence this is great i like holding babies i'm out Oof. so I, I this part i t- that i totally get because she wants him to be aggressive and all of this because he's so big and he can't you i have i can be very aggressive but i don't like it what i am and that's like parents whole struggle is that fayil wants something from him that he is so reluctant to bring out she, he's trying to like be the best most gentle person he can be for her and she's like just fucking threaten to break something for one fucking minute and it's not it doesn't make him happy to do that and it's just so like god fail decenter yourself for two fucking seconds and just try to think about this from parents perspective yeah i got so angry once at a football game i punched a dude in the helmet and i knocked him unconscious oh wow that like that was angry yeah so if, you know that one thing tells me too is like helmets don't protect you from that kind of brain trauma like, your brain still rattles around inside your skull, you know? Like, they'll protect your skull, but they don't protect your brain. And that's so why football's a terrible idea for people to play. Uh, uh, even from the small I'm, I'm heads. Not gonna, I'm never going to argue with anybody on that. <laughs> never going to argue with something. God. Sorry, just the... But man, do I like it. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying it's not a fun game. I'm just saying all those little micro hits are causing brain damage, even in the teenagers. 
Oh, I can argue that all day, every day. Okay. Oh, it will it will kill you. It can kill you 100%. But gosh dang it, is it a fun sport? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we and you know, we, we let people take risks as long as the risks are known. You know, we let people ski when you plow into a yeah. tree and stuff. Like, I'm not saying the game should be banned because of the brain trauma, but I am saying maybe we should be a little more open about the brain trauma as a thing so people can take the educated risk. Mm. Instead of jealousy. So, but okay, what I want to go talk about with Perrin particularly is we are in full empath mode where now we get to sense everybody's emotions and spend like 20 minutes talking about why that person feels that way. <laughs> We're not necessarily 20 minutes, but it's like this is full Perrin reacting how, to how people feel rather than to what they do. Mm-hmm. It's where I really, I have to be careful to read these chapters from Fael's point of view. Because yes, she's kind of giving him the silent treatment, but she's not really doing a lot else. And she does give him a few little hints every once in a while. She's not like not helping out. So if you ignore her emotions and look at her actions, I think it's a much more fair read on Fael. That's fair. It's it's still immature, but by orders of magnitude less. And and you can also see that like Perrin and Loyal give you sort of an interesting like parallax on that em- empathy thing, right? Because Loyal is feeling the pain and hurt from both of them. Whereas, you know, Perrin is very, like, Perrin and Fael are both very focused on each other and how the other one is wrong. And Loyal sitting in the middle being like, you are both in so much pain. Could you please just make up? Oh, sorry. I said, wouldn't it be great if he actually said that out loud? Oh, God. That would have, like, melted so much tension if he had just, like, flipped the stones board and been like, you two are in too much pain. Work it out. Like, imagine all the stuff that he, if he just would have said, like, hey, you guys should be nicer to each other. Like, if he said that ten times in the whole book, how different the book would have been. Yeah. It'd be so much shorter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God he didn't. Oh. <laughs> I need my 14 books. Yeah. But it's... Do you know why uh, The Wheel of Time is you know why it's so thick? Uh, it's a long story. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm so mad and so happy. <laughs> it's so awful. So I got a little confused in this chapter when I first read it because he talks about encountering Sorelia as an Aiel. She was who says you mean su- No, su- so he does talk about. So I got confused because I was like, wait. Because he doesn't know that Sulin is Aiel, right? Uh, he does at the end of this he's chapter. An, he's, he does at the end of this yeah, chapter. He sure does. So there's, there's a, he does talk about Cerulea as Aiel, and for some reason I confused Cerulea and Sulin's names, and I was like, wait, how does he not know Sulin's Aiel? He just talked, so I had to look that. I, uh, yeah. And and Cerulea does show up at the end. So there was I got Sulin and Cerulea confused throughout the reading of this chapter, so I just want to, you know, as you guys were saying, you guys get confused with Narishma and Deshiva. I, I have a similar problem with Sulin and Cerulea. That's fair. They're older, like, they're both badass. Like, one is just a maiden of the spear, and one is just a wise one. But they're still both badass. Mm-hmm. So badass. And wreck stuff. Such strong forces of will. <laughs> oh, yeah, like, we're doing this. No, no, we are. And you're like, oh. But Cerulea can't channel, is that correct? She's only a dream walker? Cerulea can channel. Okay. She channels at the very end. She has that tiny little flame that is looks like the most defiant fuck you ever in Perrin's eyes. Because she can barely channel. She's like more gaze. Oh, but the, okay, again, this is where channel. I got Sulin and Cerulea confused. Sulin is just a maiden. She's the disgraced leader of the maidens on the side of the dragon wall. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorelia shows up for a hot second. And then she has the whole thing with Nendera. There's the competition with Nendera for, like, who's alpha and all of that. Yeah, who's the leader of the maidens, yeah. Yeah, she's she was second in command and then has to step up when Sulin disgraces herself and becomes a servant. Yeah, and then... Back and then in whatever period of time forward, they both have this knockdown dragon yeah. fight, and then it looks like Sulin wins, but then Nandera is the leader. Yeah, she wins the fight, which means she has less G. <laughs> and so then Nandera is the undisputed leader. So Sulin is permanently demoted because of the choice, the snap decision she made with the Shadow Logoth thing. Um, yeah, Soralia has has a small amount, has a small ability with the power where she can do that small stuff. But she, there's, there's very little that she can do. I think it's, I think it's mentioned multiple times that she would not have 
become a novice. And if she would have been, she would have been asked to leave like a week later. And I remember there's a thing where Cad Swain's like, how do you have such a strong personality and are such a weak channeler? Because up until then, it's always like strength of channeling and strength of will go together. And then Cerulea just like completely blows that out of the water and Cad Swain's like, damn, this is awesome. Exactly, because previously it was the only people who were strong-willed were the ones who had a lot of strength and the power because those are the ones who were in charge. Because why not have the most power is the most is obviously the smartest one. Oh gosh. The strongest guy on the football team is obviously the best one. Yeah, there's a lot of unconscious bias there. Ugh. Yeah, and that's like the one thing that always drove me insane with the Aes Sedai is like, just because you're more powerful than one person does not make you the better. Does not make you better than the other. And two, just because you're 300 years old does not actually make you smarter than somebody who's only 30. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Ugh. Like, I just, I, I just, just pull my hair out when they're like, well, I'm Aes Sedai. I've been around for 200. And that's like your only argument. I've been here longer. Well, then you should know better. <laughs> right. Um, we get a little bit with Sulin, you know, doing the curtsy and feeling very, very shamed. She's so bad at it. No, she's Love getting it. good at it. That's why she's so ashamed, and she's good at it. <laughs> yeah. I love how Perrin can smell her shame. Like, that description just gives you this, like, his empathy lets you actually see behind, like, the stoic Aiel face. You know, and it's just... Oh. She's giving off the scent women do when they cry. She's basically... She's not actually weeping, because she's too badass for that, but she's literally crying on the inside. Weeping. Yeah, when the bitter sweetness women gave off when they wept from emotion, which is like, yeah, I that feeling does not require actual tear duct activity in order to be present in one's soul. <laughs> it really doesn't. Yeah. Which is why she is, she changes her mind about her G. This is like, she's five minutes from changing her mind about her toe and being like, I've done it. I have officially, my shame has been met. This is like five minutes before. Like, she has reached the absolute pit right. of this process for her. Yeah. She hates herself right now. She would rather be dead at this point. Yeah. Yeah. And thank God that Fairlane walks in with the sword. And immediately, she's the first one to go, oh, my God. I feel like there's a series of, like, hits that come. Like, Paris standing there and it's sort of a boring, normal day that he's, like, kind of worried about. And then Dobrain walks in and says, all right, a bunch of people were fucking poisoned. Lord Marengel and High Lord Malon were both killed. Oh yeah, with the yeah, where Barely was sent through. Yeah, that's his whole point. And then Colaver is basically making a meeting and making a play for the Sun Throne. So it's like, and we saw from Min's visions, and we talked about this how you know it's clear that Colaver assassinated those two because those were the three people who were in contention for the throne. And once Rand was confirmed gone, and it takes Perrin a while to get there, but he eventually realizes that once the Aes Sedai had taken Rand completely out of the city the political folks were able to make their play and start doing things that they would never have done if they assumed Rand would be back and so the fact that they're making these plays means Rand is gone for they think Rand is gone for good and specifically Colaver Specific, yes. like we get we get this this whole I mean, we've seen it happening and we get more description of it later but basically Colaver was told start laying the groundwork and when this happens when we leave the city set those plans in motion. And so that's why Marangale is poisoned on the same day that Mylan dies on a footpad's knife. And footpads are not heard of during the Feast of Lights. Because everybody's out like, drinking. These things are all... Right, and these things were all set up in the weeks preceding because Colaver was let to know, like, this is, this is going to be an option for you. Get ready. I wonder if the Aes Sedai timed the kidnapping with the Feast of Lights so she could do this. Because uh, well, they were they were trying to get a meeting for quite a bit of time before this happened. Yeah, they kidnapped him, hold him for three days, and then take off for three days. And this after they've been gone for three days, the Feast of Lights happens. Right. So I don't yeah. think that the Feast of Lights was actually timed with that. Gotcha. Yeah, I don't. And honestly, I just don't think that they would care what it was. Like, oh, it's a great, super, it's a holiday, awesome. We're already gone, so whatever you want to do, we didn't care. Yeah. They just want to make sure that Kyrian doesn't fall into total anarchy when they take Rand out. They want to make sure that there is a leader who steps up and fills that power vacuum before it forms. Honestly, I don't think that they care about if Kyrian is in 
characters in chaos because in their mind it's already in chaos well then why do they go through all that effort of setting colavera up because if they set up colavera if they say colavera do your thing then they have the leader of kyrian in their pocket well right that's why i'm saying they care that that it doesn't fall into anarchy it's because then it wouldn't be a good ally yeah they don't yeah they want they would prefer her to be in power, but they honestly care. And I don't think Kohler is a dark friend. I think he's an opportunistic idiot, like a light. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no. I think it's definitely short-sighted political machinations of just, like, we don't want to clean up a mess here. We want a nice, ambitious snake to just take the power. Because that's... Yeah, and if you take yeah, you take the power, do whatever you want. We don't care. Do whatever. You're in power. You owe us because we got you in power. Then, great. Yeah, so... So, so yeah, Dobrin basically spells that out for Perrin, a.k.a. us, which is nice. <laughs> no one is manipulating Colavera. She is all about it. She might have even come... Oh, yeah, no. No, they just found who would do it. <laughs> yeah, oh, you guys are going to do this? Great. Let's do it. I'm in. Yeah, what is yeah. it? So... And, like, Dobrin only got one visit because he's like, no, I swore fealty. You're not going... Like, I'm not going to play this game at all. Yeah, and, it, and and to be honest, I don't think that the I said I would have cared. They're like, oh, you're one, we're out. Yeah, no, for sure. It was also something they could occupy their hands with while they waited for Rand to fall into the trap. It's like, just pull strings as you do. Yeah, and Berylaine had Anora as, a, as an advisor, so they probably felt that she was more pliable to an Aes Sedai because Anora was her advisor. So why wouldn't she listen to an Aes Sedai? She's been listening to one forever. Right, even though she didn't listen to them. At all. Yeah, because she's not an idiot. <laughs> right, because yeah. Barrelane's awesome and actually has her own opinions. Uh, she's my, like, second favorite female character in the whole book. She's really great. Aside from the whole being a homewrecker thing, but we'll just set that aside. She's great. What about the turn at the end to just fall in love with Gollum at first sight? Because he's pretty. <laughs> oh, I know, I love it. I it's love so it. so funny. I love it so much. And she get and she just just gets stupid. Like yeah. she just is googly in, just, eyes. Oh, it's great. <laughs> She's like, who is that man? Oh, that's 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 Gollum. Oh, I want to be on him. Yeah, what'd you say like, his name what? was? What? <laughs> yeah. Like amazing. And uh, you're still staring. You're standing here. You're holding something hot. Oh, I didn't realize. Oh my. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So he like yells at her the second she walks in, and that astonishes her enough that she drops yep. the sword. Yeah, which, you know, it, it falls, and then you watch this drama happen, and then it's Perrin brings your attention back to the sword, because it's a little important. By that sword lying there was a strike of lightning. Fast was foolish and sloppy in forge work, but Perrin's hackles rose, and a growl rumbled deep in his throat. You know, it hits him right away, that sword. And Sulin is half a second behind him on putting it together. I would say even in front of him, she just has a half second before she proclaims it out loud. He just says, thinks it in his head. Right, yeah, he starts growling right as she starts crying out. Like, uh... Yeah, he... Yeah, Perrin, I love you. I love you, Perrin, so much. I feel you in my heart. But he's a little slower than I feel like everybody thinks he is. <laughs> like, Sulin says it, and then like he was like, why isn't Rand... That's what Rand always carries with him. What is going on? And Sulin's like, oh my god, they took him. And he goes, oh, fuck. Yeah, but he's yeah, the kind of leader fair. that, like, yes, it takes him a while to get some of the more, like, intricate details of the plan. But he thinks, he, he never forgets about the rations or the wheels or, like, there, you know, someone comes to him with a concern. He's like, yeah, I've thought of that. I know how to fix it. Oh, 100%. He's, 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 he's at 100 places at once. It's just you want to have him make connections super fast. That's not parent. Exactly. He'll make them for sure. Mm-hmm. But he's he's probably I think of him as a very slow parallel processor. His single threaded processing speed sucks, but he can do all the different problems at once. You just have to use them in the right way. That's fair. <laughs> I'm into it. So and I love how uh Sulin just like without even doing anything walks out to the door and just yells the first uh I yield and just, just talks a bunch of crap to her and goes, Who are you? Run. Yeah, and then the the chick and she just bolts. It very much mirrors the scene where she falls. She uh, gets her uh, G, you know. Yeah, where she uh, yeah. uses hand signals to the guy shine is like it's emergency. Go get help. She's doing the exact same thing. She's just saying it out loud now, and it's an actual more of an emergency, really. And she uses hand talk. Yeah, and she is the is the exact person where if she says something, it's not a are you sure? It's a oh, it's happening. Like this is 
she does not joke. We're doing it. Uh, and point of note, something I have to look up. She says, Run Woman, are you Far Dar's Mai or Shayan Matat? And I was like, what's Shayan Matat? Old Tongue for Stone Dog. Uh, Shayan Matal in my book, but yeah. Oh, Matal, stone dog. Right. It is Matal. Are, you, are you a maiden of the spear or a stone dog? Because <laughs> they have the heavy feet and they retreat. And, <laughs> and they're the, yeah, they're they the, don't um, retreat because they can't run. They're rear guard. Yeah, they're, they're yeah, because they're slow. <laughs> <laughs> I left, yeah. yeah. Can you run or are you stone? Yeah. Yeah, and then Dobrin's still like, oh, God, this old woman just is yelling at shit. Thank God she didn't say anything. Right. Berlin's and... like, I'm getting, I'm putting it together, but I don't get the livery. And Sulin just gives her this look like, I will cut you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's that lady who will cut you, and she will show you the knife as she's cutting you like this one. <laughs> yeah, she's like, if you say one more word about why I'm in these fucking Wetlander clothes. <laughs> so great. And he's like, and he had wanted to protect the white holder woman from Dobrain. It's like, yeah. I know. And I'm like, Perrin, did you not smell the shame coming off of her? Can you not? Like, it's what you're saying. Like, he's he's a little slow on the uptake. He, he should get it by now. Well, I feel like he thought the shame was that she was a servant. Well, it is. Because she's a heel. A heel don't do servants. Well, yeah, but, but not like she got bumped down to servants and Perrin still isn't that person that a servant is can do those things. Mm-hmm. I, I think he would have. He knows the difference between how normal servants smell and this smell. And yeah, he, I, and, and he had no idea she was Aiel before this. I just feel like yeah, uh, yeah, valid, valid. I feel like Aiel just all should smell like the desert. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> not after a year in the wetland. Yeah, I guess not. A little moss growing on her, and then we have this hilarious like double uh, plot where. Berylaine is, like, stalking Perrin, and Perrin's trying to, like, think uh, out military strategy, and it's just this, like, physical humor comedy of errors, like... Or it's just a... It's physical comedy. It's just physical comedy. I pictured uh, the movie Clue in my head where they're just running from room to room, like, just, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? God damn it, just stop. I, I was thinking um, Scooby-Doo and, like, the ghosts, the hallway of doors, where they keep coming in and out, and they're chasing yes. each other, and then suddenly the ghost is chasing them, and then... Yeah, they keep jumping. Yeah, they keep walking around, walking around, walking around, walking around. And she's completely doing this for her other little game with Perrin and Fayil. Like, this has nothing to do with the Rand situation or whatever. This is just her little homewrecker personal hobby thing. She made a pledge, and she does not break pledges. That's one thing about the Wheel of Time. Yeah. You give your word, and it is almost unbreakable, and you will do any. You know, Matt does it, Barrelane does it, and her, her oath was she will take Perrin. It's true. She's very dedicated to her causes. One cannot accuse her of giving up easily. She would be blue. Yeah. I I hated her so much that I first read through because I'm like, she's like you're you continuously are hitting on Perrin. Obviously married, obviously not into you. And then at the very end where you find this out, then it's like, oh, you were doing what you could for your country. I get it dick move but i get it yeah yeah no it's one one can judge her and admire her at the same time for sure be like you have bad bad choices you're making bad choices but i understand why and it's not yeah but she saw like yeah she saw parent and she felt that she would have been a better choice for parent in and because she didn't know rand was going to die so in her mind she gets married to parent parent is now and this is also way before the two rivers are a thing. Mm, mm-hmm. So she gets married to Perrin. Perrin is now with Mayin. Now her and Perrin rule Mayin, which completely protects her, her country. Because no way Rand is going to screw over his best friend Perrin at, in this country. So he now, she has protected her country. She now has a smoke show of a husband and, and, and has all these things that she wants. And it's more political for her. Whereas she looks at Fael and goes, look, like, you're like number five for Saldea. Whatever. That's some crap country up north. I'm My country's better. Let's do this. Yeah, who'd want to be on the borderlands when you could be in tropical man? That's a really interesting point that I never thought about how much Berylene was looking at her and Fael's relative political positions. And, like, we even get it from Fael later that, like, Berylene truly pers truly assumes that everyone sees the world as she does like through that political lens and 
I never really thought about how Fayil must have looked to her, given that. A political rival, that's all. And not anyone who matters. Not, like, you're just in this because it would be a good feather in your cap. Like, yeah, I just, I'm, ah, ah, my brain is melting! It's Democrats and Republicans who, like, can argue and be, you know, super uh, vile to each other in and then go have a beer afterwards. That's Barrel Lane's perception. Fayil is uh, of the opposite, the that politics mean more than a political game. It's your life. And she even mentions it growing up. She was in Mayin, and she was bullied by Ter. She was bullied by Ilian. She was bullied by every country down there. And she did. she grew up with the fact that all of these countries wanted her country. And she had to be strong, and she had to basically only think politically. And true love, what's that? That's a that's a storybook. Can I also make a parallel between her country and her body and her actions? Uh, yes. Mm. That she has to play everybody, and she's only slept with two people, and her country's only really had, in, you know, interactions. It only really trades with tears. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's this, like, but she has to flirt with everybody. And so, like, I think there's a the parallel between the way she treats her body and the way she treats her country. And I think that's deliberate by Jordan. Yeah, and it makes sense, too, because her country is an exporter, right? She doesn't have land. She doesn't have manufacturing. She literally exports a natural resource. Mm-hmm. Her that goes doesn't well have with, a lot going on there. Yeah, it goes well with selling her boobs or the, the promise of boobs as political currency. That, oh. And she wants you to... St- and- she uses her body so well that it's like, look at how, look at, uh, she knows she's gorgeous. She knows it. She is a gorgeous blonde. And, hashtag and so is Mayan. <laughs> and so is Mayan. And it's like, you want to sit there and be like, oh, well, like you're staring at her and then she's going to be, and she's intelligent. She's so smart. And even Dobrain says she knows how to run a country well, mm-hmm. but she'll throw down these, these papers and these documents that, will screw over your country if you don't read them and, and, and understand it. So yes, yeah, stare at her boobs all you want, but sign what she wants you to sign and she's going to get her country much more, many more benefits than than you would want them to have. It reminds me of the mathematician that got into poker and, or, and wrote a book about poker and got into it and is now a world champion. And a lot of what she takes has taken advantage of is the fact that she's a female and her opponents won't take her seriously. <laughs> that combined with the math has made her uh, a powerhouse uh hashtag distractingly sexy uh. but yes the the homewrecker part and this interaction with parent and not leaving him alone is infuriating but you really have to see it that she is she feels like she's just playing a political game entirely yeah no i mean what you guys are convincing me of is that she does not see herself as a homewrecker that's not what she's doing. And that's always why I've been very frustrated with her is because I'm like, can't you see that this relationship is not what you would have been pursuing with Perrin? And you guys are really helping me realize that, like, no, she does not have that perspective. <laughs> it's not until she sees Galad that she's like, oh, that's what love feels like. Yeah. And that's why she falls head over heels and can't think straight. And if Fayil even says it after, they, after she gets rescued, you and Perrin would be a terrible match. You are so political. Everything about you is political. Yeah. And Perrin is so blatantly, brutally honest. And you don't get that. And you don't understand that. Like, you, he says, well, I'm going to go do this because this. And you're thinking, why would he do that? What else does he have to do? What, what else is going on? But he's literally going to go to the blacksmith to make horseshoes. And you're thinking... Who who is he going to sell these horseshoes to to get a benefit for my country? <laughs> right. And it's like no one. Your horse needs horseshoes. Like it's he's just too good of a person. It's Rand in, in Kyrian, uh, burning the invitations all over again. Yes. 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 Totally. Totally. It's like you you just don't you, you you're incapable of thinking like that until she meets Galad, and then she's like. I and then it's a Hallmark movie. Great. Yeah, then we get the rom-com off into the sunset, and it's great. <laughs> I actually want to go back to this comment from TC Traveler. Um, yeah, so TC Traveler said, I also thought the mention of the shattering shame scent was important as a note before she gave up her servitude, Sulin. She said she'd give it up when her shame equaled theirs. And we get an insight from Perrin here that she is feeling incredible shame. And I love that callback because... 
I never thought of that. This is her shame equaling what she thinks the shame of, of the other servants is, right? She feels shame for what she did. And in my head, I don't feel like she should feel shame for that. But right. it's, you know, Aiel are obviously weird because they have their own thing. And I'm never going to understand her. <laughs> but it's she believes that she she has she has towed towards towards everything i get it but i don't <laughs> yeah i always thought that it that she felt the shame of rand getting kidnapped and that was what drove her over the edge i never really thought of all the shame she accumulates in her what five six weeks of doing this i never really thought of that as being what it was yeah she she had she was punished because she had she talked to a guy shine as a as a maiden I get it. You have to be punished for that. Totally get it. But as stated a little later in the chapter by Nandera, like even Guy Shine thought your pride thought you too prideful. Yeah. Like it's been six weeks. We get it. And she and again, it's like Avienda. You could have said you were a wise one months ago. Right. But you were you didn't get it. You were thick headed. You thought that you were you were too prideful. You know, it just took you longer to, to figure it out because you 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 probably knew it, but you're like, that's too stupid. Like Savannah, why is she considered a wise one? Because she just said, boom, listen to me, I'm correct. And everybody went, well, uh, okay. And if one person would have said, no, you're wrong, then somebody else might have said, yes, yes, yes. And this, and obviously the whole Shido thing wouldn't have happened. Well, I mean, or they get killed like to sane at the end of this chapter. <laughs> well, yeah, then I was going to go to at the end of the chapter. And then I was like, when, as soon as I said, and one person, I'm like, oh, well, we'll see. Yeah. But like, maybe somebody else would have come up like at the end where, where ever, all the other wise ones are like, look, Savai, you're being retarded. Like, we're going to, you're done. Like, we're, we're done listening to you. You've ruined our shite out. Yeah. Well, and that's basically like Tharava is the next best thing, but Tharava is a, flawed <laughs> person to step into that power vacuum but she's better than Savannah so that's the problem is like it doesn't matter how awful you are hashtag Seth could cut this if he wants to <laughs> Joe Biden could be the worst person in the world but is he better than Trump mm-hmm yeah like it doesn't matter what you are what you do are you better but with, yeah, Sulin, she just is so shameful. Like, and it's like, exactly, Bambi, when the bar is set so low. With Sulin, I feel honestly like at this point, she's done it for so long, she doesn't know how to say it. I need to stop. Yeah, she's stuck in a rut and she doesn't see an honorable way out. It's like, I want to stop. Like, I'm done. I have become, I have, like, and, and as Seth said earlier, she got good at this. She got good at being a wetlander servant, which all of them didn't understand. So she got good at this, and then she's like, I don't know how to stop. And it, it took Rand being kidnapped. It's like, yeah, she needed an event to break free. She couldn't just keep doing – there was no day-to-day -day thing that would be like, this pebble, this rock has been moved, or this hole has been dug, or you've been beaten right. enough. You know, yeah. It's it's Egwene getting back down on her knees and saying, keep going, and everyone being like, I, you have no toe towards me. There was no one to say that to Sulin. And I, yeah, and like, would she have, if this had happened the day after she put on Wetlander Servant's livery, would she have felt her honor allowed her to go? Or did it, I think did it need to be six weeks of grinding her nose into this in order for this event to like, I mean, I guess Rand getting kidnapped is pretty unique, so. This specific event would have, would have stopped everything for her. But, you know, if there would have been an event that caused her to be like, no, I need to be a maiden three weeks prior, she would have been a maiden. I love this conversation in the chat. I'm seeing TC Traveler. Nope, no way. She had to feel the shame first, followed immediately by, Mar immediately by Marguerite. I don't think she would have abandoned Rand no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> Which, <laughs> I love that contradiction because, like, we don't know. We don't know until you put her in that situation what she would have done. Absolutely. And like, and my, and my question for, for both of the TC and the Marguerite is, when did she feel the shame? Is it stated in the book how long ago was she shameful? Or obviously it's stated in this chapter, but how long ago did she herself feel shame? Like, would this have happened a week ago, two weeks ago? Who knows? I know we see her blush the first time she doesn't fumble a curtsy, but 
that's not necessarily the same depth of shame. Yeah, that could be like, holy crap, I did it right, or god damn it, I did it right. <laughs> Tracy Traveler and Marguerite are both typing. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, she she starts out, as soon as the Shadar Logoth event is over, she's kind of, like, supposed to be ashamed, right? As soon as that situation resolves, so then it sort of waxes and wanes. It's it's an event that we could talk about for five hours, and and we could still not have an answer afterwards, because we don't know inside of her head. I mean, it's a, it's a fantastic discussion question that both sides could be correct on. Yeah, TC Travel is making the point that that, that instance is really the point that broke her. Because that was before the sword showed up, and that she would have put it off after that moment, no matter what, whether Rand was kidnapped or not. Yeah, you could totally argue that, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then it's just, it's, you know, the the Rand instance happened, you know, 20 seconds later. Yeah, yeah. And then it's like, and then that sadly begs the argument of, well, this happened. But what if it hadn't, well, it happened. And maybe neither one would have been enough without the other. Which one was the straw that broke the camel's back? Because if you know, well, Rand being kidnapped probably, but yeah, it's, it's whatever. It's a, it's a great argument that we could discuss and I'm sure we'll keep discussing for days after this. To be honest, I think what would have happened is if he'd gotten kidnapped before she felt the shame, she would have broken out of character, done what she had to do and then paid 10 times the price. Yeah. She would have been like, I have to go save him, but if I survive, I'm going to need to restart my year in a day, so to speak. Yeah, I could, I could definitely see that. She wouldn't let Rand go, but she also needed to be a certain amount of ashamed before she could let this pretense go fully. So it's good for her that all these things happened at once. <laughs> it's not good for anybody else, but it's good for her. We can point out that uh, this is where Berylaine says that she knows about the servant putting poison in Marengale's wine. This is information that drives another wedge between Perrin and Fayil when he comes back in the next book and is like, where's Berylaine? And that's what he cares about because she says, here, I have proof of the poison in Culliver's, right. being from Culliver's orders. And that's important. She does mention, and she will hang for this. Yep. Yep. Well, no, but she hangs herself because he denies her that. She's supposed to get hung. Maybe not ironic was a good word, but she hangs herself and Berylin said she will hang for this. Uh, perhaps a bit of foreshadowing there. Yes, thank you. I well, it's, it, it's because that is the, the punishment for nobles is to be hung. Nope. Mm -hmm. No. It's beheaded. not? Then why does she... Oh, oh she so hangs forth. herself because she can't. you can't commit suicide by beheading. She can't. Right. Yeah, you can't behead yourself Yeah, yet. that's challenging. So you hang yourself because you don't want to live out your life poor. Right. Yeah, it's a very convoluted series of series of uh, decisions that she makes. Because yes, poor is bad. Being poor is worse than being dead. Oof, right? Oof, poor people. Oof, people with androids. Ew. Hey. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> Love you. I Love you too. Apple cultist. <laughs> all day. Oh yeah, me too. Totally. Look, all I'm saying already is we can name our group chats. We can name them. I can't name a group chat with you in it. Well, maybe you should chat with me in Discord then. Because we can name chats in Discord. Shut up. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Alright, so Galena. It is expensive to be poor. It is stupid. It is. I feel like he's pointing out that there's sort of a bit of a, a why isn't Elaine named after her father thing, right? Elaine doesn't have the... She isn't named after Terengil. She isn't named Elaine Domadred. She's named Elaine Dracond which is her mother's name. And there's that thing that he married into their family, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. And of course, Dobrain being Kyrian is like, why'd you go marry off into that Andoran family? They should have come to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, as, as Marguerite's pointing out, this is the same argument that uh, Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip had to have. Ah, yes. So this is actually a, a I don't think it's retcon. I think it's RJ actually hat tipping to the fact that Royal names matter and go strange directions. Gotcha. Also, isn't it interesting that you've got uh, more gay Stalmondred <laughs> as Elaine as the history? As the, I guess they're, it would make them related, right? Because we know they are. Yeah, Moraine is Elaine's aunt. What was Gawain's last name? Tricond. Galad's, sorry. What is Damadred. Was it? Was... Yeah, Galadred, exactly. Damadred. So Galad was the Damadred. Well, and he was born from the previous marriage. Yes, so they, I don't, I don't believe, you know, way back when they were all tiny, tiny babies. I don't believe that it mattered that Gowan and Elaine 
were Trakans because the Lod was a Damodred and he was going to take the throne of Kyrian. Yeah, that's what Terengale was hoping for. So with Terengale thinking, oh, my oldest son is going to have Kyrian, whatever. Okay, now Elaine, Trakond, Andor always has to have a queen. Boom, Elaine is a queen. And then Gawain, Gawain is a Trakon because he is going to be her first sword. Mm -hmm. So it would make sense for him to be Trakon because he's going to live in it. That's, that's how I thought it. Yeah. Plus, Terengil was the weaker partner in that political arrangement, whereas I think he was more of an equal with Tigraine Mantiar. So that's why his name was on the marriage the first time with the first child. And again, yeah, Galad never would have been ruler of Andor. So he doesn't need an Andoran house name because he's in a much better position to go be, yeah, king of Kyrian at some point. Yeah. You could be a really cool noble in Andor or be king of Kyrian. What would you rather have? Right. Because he, of course, didn't know that Galad would have zero power ambitions at all at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I can also see Dom and being like giving in and being like, sure, I'll give up my last name. I've already got my heir. Because it was a pretty shaky political alliance there with the succession. Like, there was a lot yeah. of, like, everyone just hold your breath and let the glue set. <laughs> yeah, and she really married him just to solidify her claim. It was like, she already had it, but, like, it was on shaky ground, and that, like, brought in yeah. the rest of them. It created continuity. And then he still had relevance in Andor, which he wouldn't have had as the father of a not-to-be queen. But also, he by marrying in the Andor family, he gave up his chance to rule. That was the whole problem. Like, he, he, he was very bitter because he could never become ruler of Kyrian. He couldn't, but could his son? Could Galad? Yeah. Yeah, Galad could, in theory. He's got a good claim to the throne. Well, anyway. in, yeah, in theory, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is obviously 18-ish years prior to the story, so none of the shenanigans was even happening. So the other thing I have just in this perspective is just the the great, like, how far can we trust the savages? How far can we trust the tree killers? I don't care who trusts who. We need to go get Rand back. It's delightful. Oh, there's also evidence here for the 10-day week. Oh, really? Nandera tossed the bundle at Sulin. Past time you saw your, past time you saw your toe met. Almost four and a half weeks, an entire month and a half. Uh, four and a half weeks is only 33 days in our time that's mm -hmm. not a month and a half a month and a half well but if four and a half weeks is 10 days well that's 45 days that's exactly a month and a half why robert why so from that sentence you can figure out how long a week is mm. or either a month or a week has to be different because in our world four and a half right, weeks right. is not a month and a half <laughs> yeah I think we do get a 10-day week stated somewhere else in the series. We yeah, do. This, this gives you the math to say that, yeah. Ugh, so annoying. And then we get this discussion about uh, how many Aiel can get brought. So we're looking at maybe 100,000 Aiel or maybe just a few thousand. Whatever. No big deal. Yeah, just a few orders of magnitude. It's fine. And this is really where we're scaling up from what I consider pre-World War One levels of... Uh, troop activity to post World War One. Oh War I. yeah, Dumai's Wells is definitely the war to end all wars. It's the Great oh, War. It's, like it's the awful and terrible at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like surely it can't get worse. Surely that's the worst that can possibly but happen. But wait, but Billy Mays says, but wait, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> there's more. What's behind door number? Fuck you. That's the last battle, which of course we know <laughs> isn't the last battle. It's just the last battle. Th this is the first battle. <laughs> Yeah, the last battle isn't even as brutal as as Jumai's Wells. Honestly, it's not. Rolling Ring of Earth yeah, and like, Fire oh, is people just people killing people. Like oof. I get it, but oh, like, oh, rough. Yeah, I'm gonna need some serious fortification to actually do the Jumai's Wells chapter. Like, oof. I'll do it. I'll do it for you. It's fine. <laughs> I, I'm in, I'm I'm not no sensitivity. Soralia has fire, and it's awesome, even though it's really weak. It's what what's the uh, the line here? Small, flickering, weakly, somehow it seemed a declaration of war stronger than trumpets. War to the knife. Soralia will bite your throat out with her teeth, if that's what it takes. Yeah. We get the line here also, the Shido are moving south from the King Slayer's dagger in force, and we know that's set up by the Aes Sedai. Because they're, they're going down to <coughs> liberate Rand shortly. <laughs> and we see that for, yeah, we'll see that very quickly from uh, another, her point of view. Uh, not Sulin. uh... 
Savannah. Too many S names in this chapter. Way too many. Cerulea, Savannah. Oh, man. And they're all Aiel. Sul and Cerulea, Savannah. Yeah. Yep. All right. We can actually prospective switch to Galena now, I think. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, you know, love seeing Dobrain. Oh, yeah. Dobrain and all his loyalty. The loyalty. Yep. And that's why he becomes king. Right. And Perrin's like, do you want to go attack Aes Sedai? How can you make your people do that? He's like, well, um, I swore an oath, so it's not a choice. Yeah. Yeah, Dobrain, you're great. Yeah, he's in. He swore he's he's in till till he's dead, till whenever is over. And he has an honest rebellion against Rand at first. Well, not rebellion, but he's honestly opposed to Rand until he's honestly brought over. Much like Darlin. It's like there's a lot of guys that like Rand has to convince them. They don't just lap up to him because he's the dragon. He has to prove himself. But then they are in permanently. I did. I so that's why I like Dobrain. Is Dobrain was like, I literally don't care what or who you are. I want what's best for Kyran. If you want to prove to me that you're best for Kyran, great. Yeah. But do it. Exactly. Prove to me. And and he did. And Dobrain's like, I'm in. For for better or for worse, I'm in. Will you read us into the second? Ooh, sure. Oh, Galena is such a predator. This is going to be interesting. <laughs> By the way, there's a line here that makes me think Galena is a sexual predator on women. Oh, yes. oh yes. Okay, oh, that good. is. Oh 100%. yeah, she is a super predator, super sexual predator. Ugh, ugh. So don't like her. Um, but yes, I will read her in. <laughs> Excellent. If you cooperate, Galena said conversationally, life will be more pleasant for you. The girl stared back sullenly and shifted on her stool, a little painfully yet. She was sweating freely, though her coat was off. The tent must be hot. Galena sometimes forgot temperature altogether, not for the first time. She wondered about this Min, or Elmendretta, or whatever her real name was. The first time Galena had seen her, she had been garbed like a boy, keeping company with Nynaeve Almira and Egwene Alvir, and Elaine Tracand as well. But the other two were tied to Althor. The second time, Elmendretta had been the sort of woman Galena hated, frilly and sighing, and as near under the personal protection of Swan Sanche as made no difference. How Elida had ever been fool enough to allow her to leave the tower, Galena could not imagine. What knowledge was in this girl's head? Perhaps Elida would not have her right away. Properly used in the tower, the girl might enable Galena to net Elida like a swallow. For all of Alviaran, Elida had become one of those strong, capable Amerlins who took every rein firmly into their own hands. Caging her would surely weaken Alviaran. Properly used right now... Ugh, you slimy, scheming... Ugh. Because right now she wants to just use her against Rand. Yep. Mm -hmm. Which is smart. True. Evil, but smart. And that's the yeah. worst kind of evil, isn't it? Yeah, lawful evil is the scariest evil. Yeah. Because they believe that they're right in every in every facet. Mm -hmm. That's that's Galena to a T. She's strong and mean and hurtful. I mean, and a dark friend. Alert, in case we had. Oh uh, yeah, obviously. But even if up. she wasn't a dark yeah, friend, yeah. she's just awful. Like she thinks that Guy Dean should be treated like soldiers if they have to exist at all, rather that's than being the these attitude. like deep personal life partners that can be your companion across decades and all this wonderful. No, they're just basically hired hands. I feel like that's also partly she's a, as figured out in this chapter, she's a lesbian and doesn't give a shit about men in any facet. Yeah, as a red and as as a lesbian, she is very disinterested in whatever men have to offer in any capacity. Exactly. So for her, it's it's that argument of that I've seen all the time of, of men is they just see women as one thing and she just sees men as soldiers. As just things to use swords and to fight. Them. She also sees women that way. The way she talks about men, properly used right now. The way she talks about her Aaron. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like she sees the women as objects, as sex objects, and she sees the men as combat, combat objects. There is no. She doesn't see people as people. She is a psychopath in the purest sense yeah. of the word. Yeah. She has no empathy for other people being their own people. She only sees them in what way they can help her achieve her goals. Nodding. Like how she's like, I wish she wishes that Aaron, 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 Arian. how do I say that name? Arian could like stop crying because she looks better when she's not crying. Oh God. I want to look at your face unmarred by tears. Yeah. Like 
Oh, bitch. And it's like, come drink tea in my tent. I'll help you feel better. I'll comfort you. It's like, ew, get your sticky, gross hands off of this woman in pain. That's, that's a savage move. And it. I hope it works for you, but it's not going to work for you. And also, like, notice, too, that... At the beginning of this passage, or near the beginning of this, she's like, I don't really want to keep Rand in the crate the whole time. It seems like a lot of work. And then Arian turns her down for her little sexual predation session. And she decides that Rand is going to be beaten morning, noon, and night. And then she goes off to drink her tea by herself. I feel like she's taking it out on Rand a little bit because she didn't get her way with the pretty little girl. Why not? I mean... You can't hit the pretty little girl because you still want a chance with her, but you can sure as heck beat the guy in the, in the box. Yeah. I never caught, you know, I've never caught that before, that part of the reason Rand continues. I've always wondered, like, okay, Aaron doesn't really want to keep beating him anymore. She has sympathy because he's crying. The the Like, Galena doesn't, ex, you know, here expresses no desire to keep beating him. Why I could never figure out why he keeps getting beaten. I have completely missed the jealousy, the jealous rage angle. I've completely yeah. missed that in every one of my reads. I just learned something. I never saw it until this read, but I've just, for many reasons in other narratives, been noticing a lot of like how people take out their romantic and sexual jealousy on unsuspecting people, and it just popped this time as I was doing my notes. And I also, yes, want to give uh, credit to the comment in the chat. Not great that Robert Jordan makes one of the only canonically queer characters into a psychopathic sexual predator. Not great. Not great. No, the same can be said for the only transgender character Mm -hmm. as well. If you want to force that narrative onto Arangar. Yeah, it's... Yes, it's not great. But Galena is a great villain because she's so gross. (laughs) But this is where these books are a bit of a product of their time. The angry lesbian stereotype was a stereotype. Yeah, the feminine. Like that is absolutely something that was a stereotype in the 90s at the time. Which is still alive on the internet, unfortunately. Yeah, going off on that, the trans character, it was, oh god, which one was it? Whichever one it was. Arangar? Uh, Gal- uh, the, her real name, though. Halima. Oh, Balthamel. Uh, whatever. <laughs> what, one all of the three. three. <laughs> all right, yeah. Pick one. <laughs> Not Aganor. I can literally the never, <laughs> yeah, I can never keep any one of them separate. Like, I know it's Aganor and Balthamel. I could never, whatever. I loved how he was such a lech and such a terrible, terrible like awful sexual predator as a man that that transferred over as a woman and that i think is exactly how a man in a woman body would do is look at all these things that i can do i'm now in an area that it's okay for women to do this and i'm going to completely abuse that like a child with a new toy <laughs> exactly but that new toy he's now in an area that a lot of other people like that new toy and they don't know what that what's underneath that new toy. Yeah. So, I mean, it's still weird. And I still was like, you know, I still got the heebie jeebies about it, but I understand, like, I liked what he did, but I don't have to like what he did. Yeah. But I understand what he did. If that makes any sense. No, yeah, for sure. It's a good storytelling device. And it's a great villain. It's not great representation. And it's unfortunate that that's the only representation in that category. It's like, but, 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 but. You're devaluing how awesome this villain could be by making us, like, cross-reference all this other analysis. I am nodding. And it also would be so bad if it wasn't such a glaring exception. Exactly. If there was other lesbians who weren't man-hating, black aja, terrible people, then I might be more forgiving of this. Precisely. There's nothing wrong with Halima as a villain. There's everything wrong with Halima as the only representation for not the so-called normal. So her context matters a lot. Yes, very much so. But she's not in this chapter. We can get back to Galena being creepy as hell and very efficient. Being all like, oh, we shouldn't punish Rand, we should punish Min, because that will actually be far more effective. So also going a little forward, I do... This is the first part where Rand actually talks to (gasps) LTT. Yes! Yep. And on my notes, I put, I still am, I still am on the fence about is LTT madness or is he an actual real person? Oh, so you don't necessarily, you haven't bought all of my arguments over all the episodes that he's just the man. Oh, I've listened to all of it. Okay. So what's your, yeah, I mean, I do, I do like your argument. I do like your argument. I, I am 
let's say I'm like 60, 40 on your side. But I thought when I did this, because I'm like, as Aradia knows, I like to throw out counterpoints to a lot of, to a <laughs> lot of things. Souls are souls. And what if LTT's soul is still separate from Rand's soul until Veins of Gold? Like, he's not truly the Dragon Reborn, so there is that ability to for them to talk to each other. Because I know in your argument, you state that, like, both of their souls, you know, who who are they talking to? Is it LTT when he's alive? Why can't you talk to him when he's dead now? Do you follow? I do, I do. Uh, my disagreement there is the, that they have separate souls. That the whole point of rebirth is that, that it's one, that's your thread. Basically, your soul is one continuous thread from start to finish. You, there aren't two souls there that that could inhabit the same body, and so it's like in our world, it would be like, yes, you you're talking to yourself. There is nobody else in the room, right? There's there's nobody else in Rand's head. That would be my counterpoint there. Yeah. Yes, but so just just to throw out an idea, and I'm not, and I don't want to. I mean, we don't. Let, let's. I mean, I do want to, but we don't have to. No, go for uh, it. I, 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 I want to hear your time side. for it. Totally getting it myself. So LTT has a soul. Randall Thor has a soul. Because he's Randall Thor and he's Luke Star and Telamon. Two different people. And then they, in Veins of Gold, merge to truly become the Dragon Reborn. Where he now has all of this. He's now, you know, he's he's basically Jesus for all intents and purposes. And he can do whatever. He's super chill. He can do all the things that LTT did. He can do all the stuff. He has memories of both. Yeah, no, I I like that interpretation if there were two souls. It's one of those things where like I I disagree with the basic premise. Okay, let me let me pull some let me pull some brown aja nonsense. So, on a river in a floodplain. Yeah. It goes back and forth, right? And it makes these looping S shapes. And you can sometimes have those loops actually get cut off and you have these oxbow lakes, these half crescent lakes that are alongside the main river. I'm thinking soul is the river and those oxbow lakes are the personalities, the lives that that river leads. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to make this work with the veins of gold. The analogy breaks down, but that's what I'm thinking. Imagine that the taint breaks down a barrier so that like normally the river goes in that serpentine path. But when it crosses back on itself, the taint breaks a little channel between the river like a shortcut between the two puddles right that's that's how the oxbow lakes can get cut off or rejoined so i i I guess the the taint is like a river a dam upstream breaking and then just flooding everything with mess right or that you have like (laughs) because you've got the water flowing both ways around this dam all of a sudden you like have a reversal of flow and that's why you get the memories coming back into the present yeah, I don't know. The, the analogy doesn't work, but I just, I was thinking like the Oxo pattern, like you can see in like LIDAR images. I mean, you've probably seen this on the Willamette River, like cool LIDAR pictures of how much the Willamette like snakes all over the valley floor. Mm-hmm. Gorgeous, wonderful stuff. And yeah, I just, I feel like the personalities are these, these little side tracks that the river goes on, but the river is the soul and is not those little side tracks at all. Mm-hmm. The soul is not Rand or LTT. The soul is, you know, number seven hundred eight nine thousand b or whatever i know i just i like i said i agree like i agree mostly with seth but there's just a couple things that i'm like oh like i just i agree with seth but i just want there to be two souls i just want Rand to be one person and i want ltt to be one person and i just i just want it maybe you're allowed to want incorrect things i'm nodding I'm not sure which side of this debate I'm on. I'm just saying as a statement of fact, we are allowed to like incorrect things or want incorrect things. <laughs> I don't know which side I'm on, honestly. Every time I hear it argued, I change my mind. So A hundred percent. Like every time I hear Seth do like a good like five minute in-depth argument, I'm like, oh, he could be right. Damn it, those are so many good points. And then like twenty minutes down the line, I'm like, oh, but what if? Mm-hmm. So it's just like I'm not saying you're, yeah I'm not saying I'm not saying that you're wrong Seth I'm just saying like I just want to like I just like I just want to be a hundred percent on this and like son of a bitch can't be <laughs> just can't be but this is a really why did he have to die <laughs> right but this is a really important moment in the process of the Rand LTT relationship because yes. they start to talk to each other and they both agree. 
that they need to work together to get out of this. And that is just huge for Rand's process through the series. Like, oh, we let's both talk to each other. Yeah, so whether, whether it's insanity or another soul, um, it's this acknowledgement of like, there's not this voice in my head making random comments. It's aware of what's going on. It's aware of me. I'm aware of it. And we have to communicate. And they're, they're asking if each other is real. Yeah, like, oh my God, there's somebody in my head. Ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, irregardless, this is still weird. Yeah, and it's... There's somebody in my head. Someone oh, okay. in my head, but it's not me. I lo- like I love the argument. I could do it all day. It's just yeah, it is a fun little. It is one of those things that uh, can be a never ending argument that Jordan left us. Those yeah. fun little yeah. You know, thank Unless you. Unless that's one of the things that it. like is actually in a note box somewhere that Sanderson read. I don't think so though. I don't think this is something RJ would ever resolve. Yeah, I just I think it's cool and I think it's a fun argument. And like again, like I said, we can go on for hours on this, but or we could return to the box and talk about the fact that the box is happening. What's in the box? <laughs> <laughs> so good. So good every time. Rand in a box. So yeah, Rand is in the box. This is the scene where we see him being muscles cramped, covered in sweat, blinded by the daylight when it comes in, and he gets taken out and beaten by Arian. Rand and Luce Theron both have their own mantras that keep them not crying out and staring into Arian's eyes. And it's really fucking intense. Ugh, so intense. We get the recap of why he's in the box in the first place. Because they pulled him out of the box. They were going to smuggle him out, pull him out, and just have him chained normally. Right. Until he saw Min. He realized they'd kidnapped Min, as we saw in between the tents. Mm-hmm. And he does into his one of I think his more badass moments where he kills a warder with his bare hands, takes the sword and kills another one before I said I can even wrap him up in flows. Yeah, he like hurts multiple warders, one of whom dies in the healing. Right, <laughs> it's like whoa. Yeah, he but before the uh, Galena says that I said I could get past their shock of him actually doing it, which then re- leads me to yeah. Maybe a person doesn't want to do what an Aes Sedai wants them to do. So what, weird. What? You kidnap somebody. Oh my god, you don't want to come with us? Oh, sorry we kidnapped you. Yeah, I'm so, like, how could a man, you, it, th- this is what the Two Rivers does. You can shield them all you want, but they will still punch you in the face if you haven't also tied their punch hands. Punch you in the face. It, this is a Two Rivers Best thing. Best 90th part Learn ever. this about them. <laughs> in fairness, the Aes Sedai pretty much would depend on multiple warders to be able to take care of one unarmed man who is also shielded, right? Like, they would. Th- I could see the Aes Sedai just being totally shocked that an unarmed man prisoner could overcome multiple warders and kill them. Like, wh- what? Like, even I would have been shocked about that, no matter, even if you expected him to try and struggle. No one, no one overcomes warders. Hmm. They're warders. They have warder training. Absolutely. I feel like this level of overconfidence would not help them pass their eyes to die test for the shawl. I mean, the amount of overconfidence any eyes to die has is a 12 out of 10, if not more. It's a wonder any of them pass their test for the shawl, honestly. I guess that's why they have to be like beaten down little mice that take 50 years to even like get a backbone to participate as a full eyes to die. There's a certain amount of brainwashing that goes on. And I think that, that the attitude that we see are independent characters struggle with so much part of what they long apprenticeship and long training leads to is basically you know 10 20 years of brainwashing before and to, that the tower is the most important thing to you and then that becomes much easier to just walk through all the struggles and walk away you know a lot of our the pain we see our characters go through is they have to walk away from rand and lan and the, and the people they love well if you've been in the white tower for 10 15 years you kind of already walked away from that life you walked away from everything. Yeah, and you've really, yeah, you've defined yourself by something really hard. Yeah. And how many of the Aes Sedai did we hear of that think fondly of their grandkids or their great-grand-nephews or nieces? Because, you know, that's the only family they have. It's people that they've met maybe once, and they just know that exist because their parents have passed away in the 70 years they were in the tower before they became Aes Sedai. Their sisters got old and died. They just have nieces and grandnieces and great grandnieces. So yeah, there's a certain amount of buying into a recipe in order to stay sane. <laughs> and you have and you have nothing tying you to the outside world except for 
everything that you've learned inside of the White Tower. So what else do you have? Yeah, and then you come out of this White Tower, This you come out of this Ivory Tower and you assume that everyone has the same base knowledge as you and you get really upset when there's a radical difference between you and literally everybody else because they didn't spend the last 20 years ensconced in a silo of echo chambering opinions. And that's why our most effective Aes Sedai are the ones who were trained outside of the tower or spent very little time in the tower. Moraine, Codswain. Gap years and trade school, kids. Don't go to fucking university right out of high school. Don't do it. Sorry, I'm not bringing personal feelings into this at all. And go abroad if you can't have the opportunity. Don't stay home. 100%. Just get out of America. Hey. Get the fuck out. Go. Yeah. Go, run. Just just leave just i mean leave. in fairness yeah. i've never left america for more than a couple of like brief vacations and i think i'm decently not a horrible person but yeah i'm enjoying the silence where you guys are not rushing to reassure me this is, great. <laughs> this is wonderful i'm getting i'm learning so much about myself you right are now. a wonderful person <laughs> you're such a wonderful person <laughs> if there were people in the world that were named uh anything else but you i would totally you're great <laughs> Ah, I am very siloed. I just try to use the internet and the internet, basically, my friends on the internet, to keep me from being too siloed. People like Obi Thunder, who question me and challenge me and force me to defend my opinions. I'm just saying, I just think what you want. I just want you to believe what you are saying. I went off on a really big rant about this in a piece of writing the other day, so yes. <laughs> It's like, I'll ask somebody why you got a tattoo. And if you give me a reason, great. I don't care. But if you're like, oh, it was something cool on a wall, then I'm going to judge the hell out of you and make fun of you. <laughs> yeah, mood. Yeah, oh, Rand's a not an inch, not a hair. He's, he's, this is, this is Rand getting a lot of the trauma that he calcifies around for the rest of the series and keeps coming back to. This is the thing he can't yeah. resolve is this experience being beaten and having this mantra that just breaks down into fuck you basically technically the word is never but it might as well be fuck you yeah and we see like an and, and i love michael kramer's reading of this this is another oh. place where the audiobook oh. really adds so much to the experience of this chapter the dashes and the pauses it just it's it's All in italics. so good oh. yeah yeah oh he yeah. takes that and just runs with it he kills yeah. it yeah and and this is it's an interesting mix of I will never trust an Aes Sedai because that's what an Aes Sedai told me to do while an Aes Sedai is beating me. Yeah, it's a logic loop that's not healthy. No. And but this is yeah, this is Darth Rand. This is him, you know, I I've I've gone we had Farm Boy Rand, we had King Rand for three books after the Dragon Reborn, and this is the birth of Darth Rand. And we have Darth Rand from now until Veins of Gold. Yep. Just to various harder versions of right just a descent down into you know shattering essentially getting harder yeah. and harder and and becoming unable to bend to circumstance and just plowing ahead with his blinders on and completely just right over the cliff, edge of a cliff it's interesting too because he here in this mantra is you know trying to not cry out that's what his entire being is focused around is not crying out and really, Darth Rand and all of the toxicity about Rand is about not crying out. It's about not having his emotions. It's about not feeling, not crying. Pray mm. that the Heart of Stone remembers tears. You know, like, not crying out and not responding to his trauma is what he devotes himself to as a coping mechanism. There's right, prophecies I mean, can... around how bad this is, dude. You can shorten that to, I will never cry. <sighs> Right, not cry. I will never cry out. I will never cry, and that's where he gets the stone of heart that knows no tears. Yeah, he is the embody. He is the avatar of toxic masculinity and toxic emotionlessness, and why Sup you need to emotions. go to therapy. <laughs> like that's Rand is having the good justifications for why those coping mechanisms make sense. Right, he is in so much pain that, like, of course, that's what he's going to choose to do. He has to deal with the whole world falling apart. He has to deal with being beaten to within an inch of his life. Like, this coping mechanism makes sense, but, ugh, my heart. And anyone's going to take advantage of any weakness he shows. He cannot show weakness. And so... Yeah, because he tried to protect men, and he got beat three times a day every day. Yeah, and she got beaten. Maybe it was only twice a day, but yeah, it's... Ugh. And this is exactly what he feared. When This is exactly why he sent away Elaine, exactly why he sent away Avienda. 
that these women can be used against him. And and in a lot of ways, like, man, that is kind of bad that you, if you have someone that you can use against the Dragon Reborn to control him, to make him do what you want. Rather because like he can sacrifice himself. He can he can dive into the pain, he can dive into death, you know, but he can't let men suffer. Yeah, I mean that's what the last that could be done is all about. Yeah. Because it's not it's not her fault that he's dragon reborn, it's his fault. So she's being punished for what he is and who he is. Yeah. The thing is that that's what the Dark One needs to make you an angry person who will just let the world vanish into darkness. <laughs> you need love. You need it. Hindsight being 20. Yeah, the, the uh, problem is you go into the battle with that attitude, the Dark One wins either way. You know? Yeah. If you win, you come out a terrible person and will just destroy everything anyway. I wonder if that's why Moraine couldn't sleep with him. Like, if that's what the avenue of bad things happening would have followed. Mm. Because we never know. We just know that it would end badly. I've often thought of that. Like, why would, why would it be bad? I'm just like, well, he have... shall we list the reasons? <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing good about that. Yes. Like, there would be, but like, you know, obviously it's bad. But like, he wouldn't have, Abby wouldn't have. Yeah. yeah. And I think each one of those three very important in three obviously different aspects what made him become this yeah i just think that maureen would have been way too self-sacrificing and would have put rand through losing the only love of his life in a self-sacrifice thing like way too soon rather than having three young women who are much more devoted to life insisting on just being in danger you know maureen runs headlong into the bear trap yeah and maureen would have been like all right let's she would have i think joined this quest to be hard to be something that needs to be there for the last battle Mm. Whereas Min calls him out on a bunch of stuff. Elaine calls him out on a bunch of stuff. Avienda has a knife and calls him out on a bunch of stuff. Like these three people, as much as they love him and in any good relationship, fight him on the things that he's wrong about. Yeah, Maureen wouldn't have done that. So they're like, no. Yeah, she'd been like, well, okay, if you think this is a great idea, I'm, I'm already committed to doing whatever it is you want me to do. Because she's been devoted to it for as long as he's been alive. She has a totally different angle on it. Oh, yeah. That would have yeah. been so bad. Whereas whereas Min is like, uh, you can't do this. Why can't I do this? Because that's a dick move. <laughs> yeah, that is totally Min's line. Because it's a dick move. So, like, you can't. You just can't. Like, you're going to do all these things. And then, you know, Moraine would have been like, well, bye. If you think this is a good idea, okay, I'll be behind you on it. Speaking of people that want to sleep with Rand, though, Savannah. Savannah. <laughs> Who's like, hey, so you were just beaten really hard, and I'm kind of going to kidnap you, but, like, do you like my tits? <laughs> it's just like, oh, my God. So shallow and short-sighted. I also love the misinterpretation about the ring around the neck that Rand's like, she's going to cut my head off, and she's like, call her out. I'm going to put a mm-hmm. ring on that. <laughs> yeah, I know. She, he thinks she wants to kill him, and she's like, I just want to chain you up. <laughs> and when you say ring... He means around it. Mm, on a leash. <laughs> it's amazing how she doesn't get the inappropriateness of trying to, like, have that interaction with him when he literally was just, like, beaten senseless. Right. He's like, yeah. wait, I'm in massive amounts of pain and you want me to get a boner? Are you kidding me? <laughs> like, yeah. No. no. <laughs> Time and a place here, lady. Time and a place. R- wrong nerves are on fire. Yeah. It's just like, this is the wrong time to assess a man. Yeah, like, I mean, if you want to see if a man's interested in you, this is a really bad moment to be gauging everything off of. It's just like, come on, Savannah, like, just kidnap him. Like, worry about seeing if he likes the way you look later, because you know you're going to tie him up and screw with him in all the ways, regardless of if he'll look down your shirt. Like, this isn't actually that relevant to your mission. Why are you doing this? I guess it's just to let us see how shallow she is, but... Well, and... There's a good contrast between the rapey Savannah and the rapey Galena here. Ugh, yes. Mm, yeah, yeah, solid contrast. But I honestly don't think the Savannah cares about who she's married to. I don't think she gives a shit about it. Because she was married to, uh, what's his to name? To Logic. The guy that died. Yes. And then she was married to Kulin mm. because she's like, oh, I'm going to marry the clan chief. Oh, I'm going to marry the next clan. Oh, well, these guys are dead. I'm going to marry the, the chief of chiefs. That's her whole plan. She's going to marry him, and then all Aiel will answer to her. The most gold digger of gold diggers. <laughs> Seriously. Oh, my God. Yeah. And he portrays her that way physically, too, with the jewelry and the everything. Yeah. You know? it dripping with all the the styles that are only for wetlanders. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Wears a ton of jewelry. Her shirts are incredibly 
sheer and extremely low cut and extremely blousy. So they're not, they're not, they cling to some things, but they don't cling when you lean over. So huzzah. <laughs> yeah. And she even has some of the other wise ones like competing with her to see who can be more busty later in the series. And it's just like, this is what a shallow vainglorious leader will get you. It's so annoying. Because it's the leader. You want to be more like the leader because then if you're more like the leader, then that's more likely for you to get ahead in life. Yeah, that's how social animals work. Yeah. DV, show them boobs off, whatever. The next thing I have is the, the actual encounter between Rand and Lewis Theron where they're both fumbling for the power at the same time. Oh, and the mechanics uh, of the shield? Yeah. With the, the six soft points, um, when they're soft, obviously they're being actively held. You have to wait for them to get hard. And that way you can use the whole, like, threading. Basically, they have to tie it off, and you can break the knot. Which is why they right, don't tie it off. Ever. Right, exactly. <laughs> By custom. They know. He's like, I just need some crack, and they're like, they're not going to give it to you, right? You need an attack. You need Perrin. This is why Perrin's need it goes there, and this is why all him and Dobrain can do is just try to get to Rand. They don't know what that means, but that's all Rand needs. He needs them to be so distracted that they tie the shield off. It's amazing how nobody knows what needs to happen, and yet it all works out because hashtag Tavirin. He And I like how Luce Theron, this is like a little teaching moment, you know, precursor to, well, this is what you have to do. Oh, I just learned it a week ago. Great. Let's do it. And then he's just sitting there, just running his fingers over, or mental fingers over those knots, like over and over again, just waiting. And it's like, oh, baby, it's going to be a few more days. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> How do we figure out how long it is between um, Rand getting kidnapped and Dumai's Wells? Do we have a timeline for that? It can't be less than ten days because there has to be the catch-up days once Perrin realizes, and that they're three days ahead. So it can't be less than ten days. They left the city three days ago, but he was kidnapped six days ago. Yeah, he had three days of being imprisoned in the city. Before the che- before the chest, before the box. That, that's why they did that whole channeling thing for a long time, where they just held the power and channeled nothing. It was so that they could channel the shield. Six of them could be channeling power into the shield and not be noticed. Because they had to hold them for three days in the city until it was time to go. And Rand doesn't know how many days it's been, but he's in the right ballpark. Yeah, is he like six, seven, eight? Yeah, he, yeah, he thinks count. six, seven, eight. And it's like, okay, that's fair, because time is probably stretching out really uncomfortably, given everything. He yeah, he doesn't have a real way to measure it. but And he's only spent the last couple days in the box, though, right? Yes. Yeah, from here on out, he's in the box. Yeah, he spent the last two days inside the box all of the time. But prior to that, he was not so much in the box. Yeah, Keith's asking that he thought Rant... Rand needed Perrin to be there so it wasn't just Tame that saves him. Well, I think that Rand, he gets out. Rand gets out before Perrin gets there, but he gets out because Perrin's attacking. Perrin and all the Aiel. And the Shido. <laughs> but I don't think it's... Uh, the the Ashaman don't show up until after he's broken out, and I do think that someone is waiting to show up to save the day until Rand, like, show. Yeah, I think Taim is waiting because he's a dark yeah. friend. He's on a hill somewhere waiting. Yeah, I always, I always got that. After the first few t- rereads, I was like, "Oh, you could have came so much earlier because you knew. Like they told you days ago. You waited until to see. Okay, well, Rand's obviously going to win this, so I might as well come and help him win it." In quotes. Yeah, I guess yeah, the Shido are more of the distraction than Perrin. But yeah, Taim shows up when it's advantageous for Taim. Either way, but didn't the Shido show up because they didn't want to? Like they were just. They were going to the the Shido show because they were going to kill the younglings. Yeah, well, Galena thinks that she's hired them to kill the young younglings. The Shido are actually planning on breaking Rand out and taking him themselves. It's a very multi layered plot of multi- double crossing. <laughs> exactly, and then because Perrin and his army show up, it ruins both of their goals, and then they both have to fight Perrin's army in which shenanigans happens Rand breaks himself out black tower shows up everyone explodes yes <laughs> everyone explodes Ugh. you ever see the video of michael reading it like while it's like ken burnsing across the uh painting of demise was oh Whoa. it's so good i i thought i remembered it being a time lapse of the painting but it's not but it's just michael reading it with like intense music and it's just like panning across this big huge banner piece of demise wells and like showing the different like little details like as they get mentioned in the narration it's really intense 
A uh, quick update. Battle Dumai's Wells takes place on the 10th day after the Feast of Lights. After th- after this? Today's the Feast of Lights. Today's the Feast of Lights. And Ten he's been more gone for six days? days. Oh. So he's been, he spends, yeah, at least 10 more days in the box. Oh, So probably oh, 11, 12 days total. Oh, Rand. No wonder you're messed up for the rest of the series. Yeah, a total of 16 days in captivity. So that's got to be rough. 16 solid days. Because, like, we're talking a minimum of 10 just parent to get to where they are now. And they're going to yeah. keep moving forward. Yeah, and I remember there's a scene where Egwene, after she gets the tower and all that, is thinking about how awful it was to be in the the cells. And she realizes that she was in the cells for, like, two days. And Rand was in for over yeah. two weeks, or for you know, almost two weeks by their, their measure. And she's like, oh, damn. Oh man, he's really dealing with it, isn't he? And I, it, I love that moment of compassion from her, even though it's very brief. It's like she counts it up and is like, "Oof." I guess he's he spent like one week in the box, according to their measure, ten days. Ugh, that's way too long to be kept in a box like that. That is some serious, like stress position torture, fucker. Right, that's torture. You know, it's not. You know, that is torture. Yeah, to say nothing of the beatings in between. Right, being right, in the right. chest is torture. The lack of water, the lack of light, the lack of contact. Oxygen, of, cleanliness, yeah. stretching, being able to void yourself, not into your clothes. Yeah. Six and a half feet tall, bent over with your head between your knees. Imagine how big that is <sighs> and how tiny that is. And here his, he's physically twitching at the thought of two or three more days in here. And he's got ten more. Oh. Yeah. Oh, Rand. Sorry, buddy. So the next thing I've got is confirmation that Savannah is supposed to kill Gawain on Galena's orders. Gawain's paranoia is completely justified on that particular front. Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> he should have gotten out there so long ago. Oh my god. Oh my god. Yes. And then the next thing I have is really noticing that this this thing with Arian standing by the chest and saying, you know, he's weeping, and then she starts right. crying, and Gal- I'm looking at this, and Galena's like, awful but really what arian is doing is arian is almost like empathizing with rand right i mean like we are both in this horrible horrible pit of despair and like honestly a hate fuck would probably make me feel better but <laughs> but this it, is the last time she beats him yeah it is and galena instead of saying oh you need closure she says you're going to beat him as often as you want and even if you don't beat him, other people will beat him. Like, Galena takes what Arian needs and does exactly the opposite. And it's just, in case you were wondering, she's a predator and a psycho. But yeah, if you read this, it's, I mean, it's, come to my tent, I have some nice blueberry tea and I will put a damp cloth on your brow. Thank you, Galena. Thank you, Galena, but I cannot. Ration and Bartol will be waiting for me. <laughs> they do suffer worse than I, I fear. Ba ba ba. I must comfort them. Uh, one grateful squeeze of Galena's hand and she glided away. Galena frowned at the chest. Mm-hmm. They had at least two more weeks to tar Valon. From now on, whether Arian wished it or not, he was to be punished every day at dawn and sunset. So immediately, almost in the next sentence from being rejected and ha- asking her to come back to her tent and being like, no, I'm going back to my green warders who are going to comfort me. She is like, fine. You, want- you wanted to forgive him because he was crying? I'm going to make sure he's punished and on his knees by the time we get there. Which is like, you see that kind of retaliatory bullshit in like every abusive man in the family at like this, the first 15 minutes of every movie. Like that's how you know he's an abusive douchebag that needs to be like killed by the hero or whatever. Like this kind of behavior is quintessential. And you can tell it's, it's she caps that whole I'm going to beat him every day with eyes tight. She went to drink her blueberry tea by herself. And the way Kate reads it, she interprets uh. it this way too. Uh, yeah and then yeah it it does she what is how does galena die oh she, she die? doesn't what? die she gets stuck with Thorava for the rest of her life <laughs> oh that's right her little lena samael right samael gives them the oath rod and she gets the oath put on her saying she can't t- and so Thorava yes. has the oath rod and makes her swear all the oaths mm-hmm. and then and and breaks her hard it reminds me of my satisfaction when Mogedian gets collared with an Idom after the last battle. It g- gives me that kind of I shouldn't be happy about this, but I am sort of energy. <laughs> uh, 
a light at uh-huh. you. Yes, which is yes. Like, oh. like, I shouldn't be happy this is happening to you. This is bad, but you deserve it. <laughs> Because Galena goes through the whole thing with Fael in the camp and, like, mm-hmm. lies to her and lies. I'm and, going and, to kill you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, like, traps her in the basement with Morghese. Like, Galena has a long and sordid history coming up. But she is, when she has to swear that last oath to not even try to escape, not yeah. even think about it, it breaks her. It breaks her hard. Yeah, and it's like, and Tharava is just as much of a psycho and a sadist as Galena is. Like, you think at this point that Tharava's maybe just, like, she's not great, but she's, like, okay. And maybe she could lead the shadow into a better place. But, like, by the time you get to the end of the series, you're like, nope, nope. She's a different kind of awful, but she's equally awful. So Galena really gets paired with her her proper um, soulmate match made in the Pit of Doom. <laughs> and she can't even, there's, she can't even go and get the, the oath right herself. The only way that she can get out of this is handed to her. Well, and that's not even... And then after that last oath, she can't even do that. Yeah. It's like she can't even hold it. Like, there is no way out of it until Tharava dies. And at that point, I don't even think she's out of it. I think she's just going to sit there next to Tharava's body. And starve to death, like, without... Yeah. Yeah. Although, I, I will say this whole scene with the Sane does make it hard for me to credit Tharava as not being that bad. Because essentially, Tharava's the one who leads this circle. Um, that's fair. Well, again, it's, yeah. Well, she leads it because Savannah effectively has talked her way, has talked her way into Tharaba and the rest of the wise ones doing it so that Savannah has sway or a hold over the, those wise ones in the future. She's like, well, I know you guys killed those people, killed it to Sane with the one power. So calm it down. So now she owns these, these wise ones. Yeah, I think that, Tharava is it's not that she isn't doesn't seem evil it's that she seems more like a lap like she's she's really ambitious and she's putting all of her energy behind Savannah because she wants to rise on that energy and it's like okay you're a sellout but are you evil like as much as I have very strong personal opinions about the differences between selling out for political gains and actual evil like reading the series I try to figure out where Tharava becomes definitively just as terrifying as Savannah, and it's not here for me. Even though Desain gets torn, gets drawn and quartered right. by the power, so I'm I'm not really sure that I'm convinced of my reasoning here because this is nasty. We delve deeper into Tharava's nastiness as well as time goes on. So, <laughs> but like you do what you got to do for your political ends, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you're a full blown sadistic like psycho it just means that you're ambitious it's just all the other things she does to all the other people under control that make her a sadistic asshole yeah and you haven't really seen much of that in her yet no, as you're yet. reading through no. this at this point you're like is she gonna save the shine at the last minute is she that anonymous op editor who's actually keeping everything under control spoilers no she's not but at this point she could have been maybe can we also talk about Aes Sedai arrogance that they wouldn't, they didn't believe that the wise ones were smart enough to come in and learn the weaves that they're using to hold Rant. And that's, they're like, they didn't, she's like, why does she have all these wilders with it? I think that's going to offer some protection. Do you mean the wilders that obviously don't know what exactly. they're doing? They're not <laughs> exactly. They're by the so white tower, so how could they even understand so anything? So simple-minded, so unsophisticated. And so Savannah turns to Tarava and goes, you got that, right? And Tarava's like, pfft. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, oh, the arrogance. It's amusing. It's And it's the same thing of why I hate the Aes Sedai. It's like, you, just because I didn't go to Stanford doesn't mean I'm not as smart as you. I just didn't go to Stanford. Right. Well, if you were as smart as me, you clearly uh... would have gone to Stanford, so. <sighs> yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I also didn't have the money for it, but you know, whatever. It's fine. Fine. That's no, why we should... it, no, you know what? Pull yourself, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, which is totally something you can do. Yeah, physics and and just earn that Shoot money. Right, yeah, and buckle down and use your smarts, or just like go into and debt also... and then pay it off instantly. Because when you get out, you'll get Instant. a, you'll get a, because you're so smart, you'll clearly get the best job. Because intelligence and good jobs go together always. There's no other reason people get good jobs; just their intelligence. Hundred percent. What wiki on Therava? Said that she that uh said that she has strong distrust in men, believing them to be unworthy of her time and attention. Another feminazi. 
Lovely. And she has a taste for torture and was possibly a sadomasochist. Is not afraid to display your often abusive... Possibly? Towards it's them. canon! Hey. Hey, man. <clears throat> well, thank you, Watwicky. <laughs> but that's canon. <laughs> so, meanwhile, Desane is thinks she's playing office politics. Oh, and uh, it turns out she's playing a very oh. different game. Oh. Just office politics, and then turns out um, you're the sacrificial <laughs> false pol- flag op. She's literally a false flag operation. That's what this is. Yeah, sorry, lady. And they even get Galena to almost confess to her murder because they don't. They're like, "You're evil," and she's like, "Ha! You don't know what I, all the things." You know, like there's a scene oh, in yeah. Crown of Swords. She thinks she's been caught they- out in a lie, and and uh, oh yeah. But the but the lie is that she killed the same, but that's not actually she didn't kill the same. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that's yeah. a funny moment. Yeah. And if she'd known, if she was actually not black, she would have been like, "What the fuck are you talking about? I didn't lie. I can't lie." Right. But because she's black, <sighs> she fell right into their hands and basically made herself um, not sane. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And became Thraba's property. And they all think it's because she knows how much shame she has. <laughs> it's like <laughs> no, that's not her motivation. <laughs> No, no, that's not, not at all. You played yourself. Nodding, Savannah fingered the small stone cube with its intricate carvings in her pouch. The strange wetlander who had given it to her and said she should use it now when Althor was captive. And that's Semael. Interesting how things would have turned out if Semael had shown up right now and taken mm-hmm. Rand captive. Tame wouldn't have had a chance. Nope. Until she'd actually looked on him, she had intended to. Now she decided to throw the cube away. She was the widow of a chief who had been Druidian, and of a man who had been called chief without making that visit. Now she was going to be the wife of the Karakarn himself. Every spear of the Aeel would be, gr- would be grounded to her. Her finger still retained the feel of Althor's neck, where she had traced the line of the collar that she would put on him. It is time, Desane, she said. Of course, Desane blinked in surprise, and then she had time only to scream before the others began their work. Desane had contented herself with grumbling about Savannah's position. Savannah had put her time to better use. Except for Desane, every woman here was solidly behind her, and more besides. Savannah watched very closely what the other wise ones did. The one power fascinated her. All those things done so miraculously, so effortlessly, and it was very important that it was seen that what was done to Desane could only have been done with the power. She thought it quite astounding that a human body could be taken apart. So little blood. <laughs> and I'm so and I'm so con- I'm so curious as to like how what did you do? How did that happen? Yeah, I do wonder that cuz drawing and quartering seems very bloody. Mm-hmm. Which is always what I imagine, but I imagine just using air, right? You just basically if you slice someone with two flows of air pressed up against each other, and then just let them separate, but then never, uh, basically, you're sealing oh. the body. Oh, gross. Mm. Oh, that's yeah. gross. Yeah. Don't do that. Don't say that. Ew. So it's, it's, imagine two very thin blades. You drive them through a limb. Or five. Yeah. yeah. Sort of like the same uh, trick they do when they cut someone in half in a magic show, where they put the blades through and then separate, but there's uh-huh. two blades. Uh-huh. Except in this case, that they're actually cutting the person. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And so then you just have all the the pieces, you cut them all apart and separate them, and they're all basically intact and whole and scattered, and there's no blood trails between them. That would be like, so that has to be the one horrifying. Power. To be the to be sane and be like, oh, I can feel myself being cut apart, but also I'm not bleeding and now my limbs are being carried away on flows of air. Oh god, that's awful. Ugh. I imagine you wouldn't survive that for too long. Well, I mean I would... if you're sealing the blood yeah. in you're going to be yeah, conscious maybe. for a few more minutes than if the blood was going out immediately. That's that's not a terrible point. Eww. Yeah. Or they're also just head, two arms, and two legs, so you're dead instantly. But... I don't think the Aeel prioritize instantaneous death in this case. I... Oh, ah. Ugh. I mean, maybe they went quickly because the noise of arm, her screaming arm, leg, leg. would have been distracting. That's I always assumed it was quick. I never kind of assumed that they this was for torture. Oh yeah, yeah, it was it was just done, 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 and because they don't they they don't the same they don't care about they they're not doing this to punish her or anyone else. They're just doing it because they feel they need to do it. Still though, it's about commitment. Even a few you know, seconds would be awful. Sorry. 
Yeah, it's about burning. Yeah, the realization, I think, more than anything else. I'm guessing the shock meant she didn't feel much at all. But shock is a hell of a drug. I mean, even just realizing that people are approaching you with the power, with the intent to kill you, would be pretty horrifying, even if you never got a physical sensation. <laughs> right, right. That panic of, like, knowing you're dying. Well, you know, and it's 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 brutal. Yeah. It's poor to say. And it's not like Savannah has anything particularly against her. It's just that she's the weakest and most not aligned member of the group. It's not actually that to say it's a threat. But the, the logic she has here is if I frame the Aes Sedai as killing Desain, I can go up in front of my troops and say, we have to attack them. Look at what exactly. they've done. Exactly. They have False broken. Flag. They have taken out the wise ones, which everybody knows you don't touch a wise one. Everybody yeah, knows that. They're sacred. They're sacred. And look what the Aes Sedai have done. They have betrayed us. It's time to attack. And let's take Rand Althor back from them. The Aes Sedai are no longer sacred. They need, yeah, that's exactly, they needed a reason for the Shido to want to attack Aes Sedai because they normally wouldn't attack the Aes Sedai. You don't do that. It's the de- dehumanize your enemy. Mm-hmm. Or in this case, humanize them down from demigods. Sure. But <laughs> <laughs> it's effective, unfortunately. It's very effective. People in crowds, mobs, they, they are easily led by graphic violence being framed a certain way. They run right into the meat grinder. Uh, rolling ring of earth and fire. Ashman kill. Ashman kill. Just savage. Coming soon to a podcast near you. Only two episodes from now. Yep, we got one episode between then and now. TZ Traveler, I did hear about the goat farm that was selling, what, goat Zoom interruptions? <laughs> yes, what? I did hear about that. Someone was selling, they were selling the opportunity to have goats interrupt your Zoom meeting or something. I, I, I just saw the headlines and was like, this pandemic has made the world topsy-turvy. But apparently they made money at it because the world is topsy-turvy and you can make money doing the darndest things. Yeah, NPR did a story about it and they were just saying that, um... Basically, she put it up as a joke and went to bed, and, like, the next morning had, like, a bunch of people trying to hire her for it. (laughs) And so she was like, well, I guess now I have a business. (laughs) That is amazing. (laughs) That's fantastic. I can't love that enough. That that is definitely, like, faith in humanity. This is what technology is for. This is why the internet brings us together. This is good. So is is there anybody that has maybe Trollocs that can interrupt your Zoom meeting? Because they got the goat eyes and... (laughs) <laughs> Narg. <laughs> Narg Narg on mute <laughs> those, are so, those guys are so angry Narg zoom interruptions they interrupted in a bad way <laughs> <laughs> Narg no hurt zoom meeting Narg just want to talk <laughs> to zoom meeting <laughs> You know mute Narg <laughs> Yeah we'll get a Trolloc filter definitely When uh, that becomes popular oh, yes. When we know what a Trolloc looks like That would be fantastic Oh my god I'm not a Trolloc I swear <laughs> I'm uh I'm a I'm here live. I'm not a Trolloc. <laughs> yes. Nice. <laughs> yes. I'm I'm ready to go. I'm not. Uh, I'm willing to continue. Uh, I'm not a Trolloc. As a Trolloc. <laughs> oh God, goats! Why? Why you gotta be like that? All lawyers are fades. <laughs> I mean, probably not wrong. Ah, I see. We we have a fade among us, guys. In Discord, we've got someone who is um oh, outing yeah. themselves as a fade and a lawyer. <laughs> Jeez. I don't know about that guy. <laughs> well, you know what they say, a uh, a fae is just a channeler that gets turned into a trollic. I, I don't know why they say that. I'm pretty sure because it's canon. Oh, right, yes. <laughs> um, and therefore, <clears throat> what you're saying uh, if you're a lawyer is that your mother's a trollic? Yep. Mm-hmm. Good sir. <laughs> that is rude. Always got a good your mom joke in there with the trollics. Oh, d- are you uh, aware of the canon around female trollics? Yes, that's why I'm making unhappy noises. <laughs> uh, 
It's so uncomfortable. It's so uncomfortable. So not okay. It makes me so, so skeeved out. Go look it up yourself. Someone wants that kind of trauma? Go Google it. Go find it. This is this is spoiler warning, yeah, but it is we don't have a gore warning, so Yeah, you you don't want I'm telling you right now, you don't want to know. Like you wanna know, you but don't you don't want to know. know. Okay, well the well the fade is saying that there's some good ones. There's some do gooder lawyers that do good. So I guess there's some fades that like do useful business keeping the dragon's peace or something. Yeah, like there was that fade that um took the Trollocs in the Stone of Terror and protected Rand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, totally. Yeah, I mean, they both work for evil, they just have slightly different goals, and so they compete with each other. Yeah, I'm into it. And then obviously, yes, the Grey are actual lawyers, but now, now we're getting into real canon, and that's no fun. Those, I'd almost <laughs> say they're like ambassadors and negotiators more than lawyers. Yeah, they're more ambassadors. Uh, nitpicking over legalese is lawyerdom from where I'm sitting. No, logically. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh... It's. I, I think you can tell who, what Aja someone is the, the way they start an argument. If they try and like argue you with logic and like this means this means this, they're clearly white. If they try and overwhelm you with facts, they're brown. Mm-hmm. I was just thinking, and what's my strategy? Oh, right. I start my arguments with technically. Yeah. Uh, yep, <laughs> That's yep, all my arguments facts. start. <laughs> Whereas I start with logically. Uh, that's true. That's true. Gray is all about, come on, guys. Let's get along and compromise. Red Aja just, yeah, threatens you with physical violence. Which is why I think Nynaeve would actually be a really good Red Aja. Oh, yeah, totally. She would. She would. Totally. But, like, I love the Red. The Red totally has a good place. But, like, you know, while, while we're typecasting, the Reds would definitely just threaten you. I mean, I, I feel like a lot of people are a mixture of two Ajas. I, I feel like having two in the Discord helps people, like, identify, like, I'm a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Honestly, right? I really like, like that about this, the Discord, being able to have two. And it gives you more categories. It gives you, whatever, seven square. It gives you 49 categories rather than the seven that you're stuck with in, right. initially. Because there's only two Ajas you can join. Only yes. two. And as long as they're not gray or black, does it matter? <laughs> black counts as zero. We don't, we don't count the... True story. Nobody counts black. It's not an Aja, and it doesn't count. There isn't a black Aja, you guys. Why do you keep lying to them? Super Skylake is telling me there's only 21 categories of two. That's way too much math. Uh, right? we'll, we'll be seven times two, so 14. How are they 21? It should be seven squared is what I thought, which would be 49. Oh, it's six factorial? Thank you, Skylake. Right, not squared. Factorialized. I, I My odds are... Statistics was never my uh, strong math suit. I always have to check situationally on that kind of stuff yeah seth you can't do your math and you're a white what are you, what what's going on here what gives statistics is not math statistics are lies <laughs> okay that's true <laughs> i went to college i can verify that as a true statement oh my god i used to think that until i started doing football statistics and holy crap are they spot on yeah uh, well that's sports ball that doesn't count yeah i uh, also wanted to throw it out there uh thank you tampa bay buccaneers for winning the super bowl uh thank you so much you're amazing uh, I can cut that. Uh. <laughs> something, something, sports happened. Yay! <laughs> yeah. Once I, once I was sure that there wasn't going to be a Wheel of Time commercial in the Super Bowl, I knew I was safe to never, ever, to not watch the game. So This is for you and all the nerds. I talked to my buddy who owns a comic book shop, and if whenever the those Funko Pops come out with Wheel of Time, He'll order however many we need. <sighs> so, like, there is no need for us to, like, worry about getting any whatever, whatever. It's just, he will order just, like, oh, you want, like, 50 of them? Done. So, uh, what what exactly are we ordering? The, like, little Funko... The little, little statues guys, with the, the big little... bobbleheads, right? Oh, oh okay. <gasps> There's no gout. I don't own any, but I like looking at pictures online. Exactly. But if, like, there is a Wheel of Time version of them, then... He's just going to just order whatever. Nice. So, and anything Wheel of Time, I mean, I'm going to have to remind him when it comes to close to them being put out, but he's just whatever you guys need. Excellent. Dope. It's nice having a hookup. <laughs> when the show comes, I'm going to be, there's just going to be so much coming at us from so many different angles. Oh, yeah. It's going to be great. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very much. There's so many things I can't, like, you just, information overload, stuff overload. Thank God. They're only going to do one episode a week. I was going to say, the eight weeks when they're dropping episodes Ooh. is going to be 
a fucking roller coaster of rewatching and analyzing. And oh I'll my god, be... yeah. After what I did with the um, music video, I'm like, okay, time to start producing some videos, guys. It, it, it's oof, that's gonna be a lot. They have to do it once a week because it's gonna take us that long just to process one episode. It's gonna feel like not enough time before the next episode drops if they give us a week. Uh, Super Skylake, I produced a, like a five minute video for um, a Wheel of Time parody song for the Dusty Wheel, and I had a lot of fun doing it, and I think it turned out really well. It's really funny. Like, the music is like, eh, but the editing together of the videos is just the right amount of campy and well-timed that, like, it's a masterpiece on the whole. The music is wonderful. Um, Fire Phoenix <laughs> is not out yet. The deadline is the 21st, so I may do some tinkering before that because I have uh, 11 days and, you know, tinker, tinker, tinker. Um, but when it comes out, and then there's a little while, like a week of judging and stuff. So you won't be able to see it until like March. Yeah, we're not supposed to share because like saving the the excitement. But Seth and I have worked collaboratively to make a truly hilariously wonderful thing. I'm really proud of it. It's very funny. Uh, Aradia's singing is really quite wonderful, by the way. You can just you tell know. I didn't memorize the source material obsessively as a teenager, and I'm embarrassed about that. <laughs> it's bohemian rhapsody it's not the easiest song to i know but i've on. never obsessed over it and it, i just feel like this is a cultural lack and you can hear that like i can carry a tune in a bucket it's fine it's just I, I should have had more confidence from years of practice the thing is that it is bohemian rhapsody and so nobody can do it justice so like trying too hard just makes me look like an idiot it's just i wish that i had the years of background neurology to be like i know this song i, I, I just don't I think as long as you can do it almost as good or if as good as mike myers then that's all you need yeah i can share the the lyrics i think because those have been public for a while and it's not the video or anything yeah yeah fire phoenix you've got the right you've got the right link that's what seth had before i i sang those <laughs> yeah <laughs> so it's i mean technically we're a little bit breaking the rules because people could figure out it was us but like i can't i'm still gonna do it uh and if we don't win anything, we don't win anything. I'm, I don't care about that. <laughs> you know, like, no, no, I'm just so proud of the fact that you wrote the lyrics, I sang the song, and then you cut together the video. It's so collaborative. Yeah, so very nifty. collaborative. And, and the lyrics had a lot of input from a lot of other people as well, After I, as I was posting them. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think I even sang an older version than what you have posted there on that link. Yeah, although the differences are pretty subtle. Yeah. Um, there was one or two little things. I, I think especially... Um, Balsamon has a power put aside for me as opposed to Demondred put aside uh -huh. for me. Yeah. I like that better yeah. uh, because then that, that yeah. refers to the one, pa the, the one power. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. I had to listen to that a bunch of times. The first, when you, I think you first put out like a version of it, I had to listen to it a bunch of times because I kept laughing yeah. at like certain parts and I'm like, oh my God, that was great. Oh crap. I missed that part. <laughs> oh my God. That was so, what did I, what did I, oh God. But the whole thing now, because I didn't, we never had a fully. I sang like a couple of lines. No, you and sang it. Sang yeah, but did I sing the whole thing? You did. You said you sang a good part. I mean, you sang or like said it really fast. So gotcha. It was, we could we could assume like we knew it wasn't perfect, but you had like some. You had a bunch of work. There are a lot of very talented people have put a lot of effort, probably a lot more than is really appropriate into this contest. And what comes out is going to be some just truly amazing videos of people dancing and singing. And I, I can't wait. Let's, yeah, I can't wait. I cannot wait. Just from the hints that people are dropping in the Dusty Wheels conversation about it. Yeah, it's we are collectively an unreasonably talented fandom. That's true. And <laughs> dedicated. Yes, <laughs> very. Thank you for listening to the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Rate us in the Apple Podcast app or support us on Patreon. Is that good enough?